And now please welcome president of Games for Change, Susanna Pollock. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to see you. We are here uh, for day three, you made it, day three of the Games for Change Festival, um, which is actually day one and the only day for our XR for Change Summit. Um, we are, we think today's a very special day. Um, 17, I say 17 years ago, in 2017, five years ago, we started XR for Change to develop a community of practice that was able to use immersive media to address real world challenges. And today we're here to cut through the hype around the metaverse and have some real world conversations about the growing number of ways that virtual reality, augmented reality, and spatial technologies are used to drive social change. But we're also gonna look at the impact of related emerging technologies like AI, machine learning, blockchain, Web3, therapeutic gaming, nanotechnology. All of these technologies are converging in ways that can enable us to make a bigger impact. And we hope that you leave here today with insights that enable you to shape the next generation of impact campaigns and experiences. While we're talking about what's next, I wanna take a few moments to give you a little preview of our future plans at Games for Change. Right now, as we celebrate our 20th anniversary, we're also laying the groundwork for the next 20 years of Games for Change. Now, the first priority for us is always our community. It's a community that reaches all over the world and we are committed to expanding our programming internationally and supporting the growth of local chapters and programs in Latin America, Asia Pacific, Africa, and the Middle East, and expanding our learning programs like the G4C Student Challenge internationally. We're also ex uh, focused on expanding our learning programs beyond K through 12 students and teachers designing new programs that integrate games, XR experiences, immersive technology for lifelong learning. We also see an opportunity to foster new collaborations between the games industry, the XR sector, and the UN programs. At the beginning of this week, we brought together leaders from gaming, tech, policy, and NGOs for the first ever Games and Sustainable Development Goals Summit at the United Nations. And we're excited to continue the work we started in that room. But last but not least, we're also working to expand our XR for Change community based on the success of On the Morning You Wake, a virtual reality documentary that we executive produced to raise awareness around nuclear weapons. G4C developed and ran a global impact campaign for On the Morning You Wake that traveled to 10 countries and included 30 activations for audiences at museums, schools, public events, and policy convenings. This work led to the publication of research that provided evidence on the impact of VR in learning and engagement, and also a best practices field guide for creators and impact producers, which you can hear about more today in the talk, Creating and Evaluating World-Class Impact Campaigns, at 11.30 on this stage. Our goal is to support the development of immersive impact ecosystem through funding, professional development for the sector, and the production of impact campaigns. We're also advancing our work around the use of immersive in learning spaces through an exciting project we're partnering on with our next speaker, Gabo Aurora. It's called Who's Metaverse? It's a program to build digital equity and inclusion by making the next generation of creator tools accessible to everyone. And we will be running, and we are running, our first pilot in Harlem this summer. So we're 20 years in. And it feels like we've only scratched the surface of the potential of what we can create as a community. So as we close out the festival today, I encourage you to think about what the next 20 years will look like. So now I am pleased to welcome our first keynote of the day. Gabor Aurora is an award-winning emerging technology pioneer, professor, entrepreneur, and former UN diplomat. Gabor's keynote will chart the journey forward in getting technology to a place where it exercises our hearts as much as of our minds. Please welcome Gabo. All right. Thank you for coming this early in the morning to, uh, to hear to hear me speak. And uh, I was just saying it's been a while 
because I've been doing so many Zoom talks, and it's good to be back on the stage. And it's great to be back at Games for Change. I was here in 2017, and I was able to really see this movement from the ground up uh, come into being. And it's been really beautiful to see all the progress, and I'm really happy for Games for Change, and they're just a wonderful partner. So um, I'll try not to bore you too much. Um, this talk, you know, is going to be a little bit about where we're headed, where we are, where we've been. And I see one of my students here, which is amazing, from Johns Hopkins. Um, at Johns Hopkins, the first thing I make everyone read in a department dedicated to emerging technologies and immersive storytelling is the Unabomber's Manifesto. And many people find that to be quite shocking. And a lot of those ideas are very shocking. And the reason I bring it up, and I want to start with that, and why we start with that in the MA program I've started at Johns Hopkins, is that while I don't condone the violence, I do think a lot of the ideas in that manifesto are becoming more relevant today than they were in 1995 when they were printed in the Washington Post and the New York Times. And I say that because the central premise of that sort of manifesto is that technology can never be reformed, that the only way forward is to destroy technology and civilization. And those sound like the ideas of a crazy person, but I think it's important in what we do because we're working with emerging technologies, to understand that there is always going to be a growing group of people who, if we don't solve a lot of the problems we see in technology today, who are going to find these ideas to be a lot more seductive. So we have to work to prove the Unabomber wrong. But I remember when I first experienced this, um, you know, I was 18 in 1995, and when I first experienced this manifesto, it made me step back and actually think about what progress is. And um, just as an aside, one of my favorite performance artists is Tino Segal, who made an amazing performance art piece in the rotunda of the Guggenheim, where you start out at the bottom, and there's an eight-year-old girl that asks you, what is progress? You walk up the rotunda, you meet a 20-year-old, you meet a 40-year-old. You have this conversation as you go up to the rotunda about life and progress. And I think it's important to never forget those types of things, of what is progress and everything that we're trying to do. So where are we now? Um, this is from the Odyssey. This is Odysseus, and it's a very famous scene in the Odyssey where he knows he's going to be seduced by the sirens and the seas, so he asks himself to be tied to the mast, to be completely unable to be, even in some photos he's blindfolded, so that he can get through where he needs to go without being distracted. And I think in this day and age now, we are living in a way that I do feel like Odysseus myself. Um, at home, my Wi-Fi router, goes off at 9 p.m. so that we know we can go to bed and not binge Netflix forever. Uh, we work very hard to not have an iPad for our son in a restaurant. We think about never having laptops in bed. I'm always trying to get through the day without technology making it more difficult. And I think what that is saying is that the tech creators of today have not thought about my well-being and my health, and they're not. It's getting more and more complicated. But there's ways around it. This is where I promote the light phone. <laughs> uh, out of the Brooklyn Navy Yards, the New York creator, the remarkable tablet. There is a burgeoning, burgeoning sort of creator group that is trying to solve problems with new technologies. And these are not related to spatial computing or VR or AR. But if there's one advice I'd give is that a lot of what we do 
in building the XR experiences that we do is to solve those problems, to think about how we can get to a better future, because it really is not where we need it to be. Now, when we started in working, and when I started working in this field, uh, I was at the UN, and I joined an incredible creator class, many of you who are here as well. Our experiences, though we might have started in storytelling, we might have started it so that we were so excited by a new artistic medium. Actually, because of the beginnings of spatial computing going mainstream, it gives us a seat at the table and really brushes us up against these future issues of technology and the future of humanity. You might not have thought this was what it was about, but this is what it's becoming. A little bit about my work. Um, you know, I, though, have a complicated relationship with technology. I love it, although I don't like it. Um, and I say that because when Leon Wieseltier had to describe Susan Sontag, uh, he'd say, I love Susan, but I don't like her because Susan was mean a lot. You know, she's kind of like, you know, was a fierce person. And that's how I feel with technology. I love it, but it has a lot of things that are very difficult. But my sort of North Star, my sort of way of moving forward was to try to infuse these technologies with artistic expression and social impact. I've seen this technology make people cry. I've seen these technologies double donations for the UN. I've seen these technologies change perspectives forever. And so there is a lot here that I think is incredible. My first experience, Clouds Over Cedra, which I made in 2015, continues to be used to this day um, by the UN to advocate for refugees worldwide. So when we get it right, it can be quite incredible. I often think what the Unabomber would have thought of Clouds Over Cedra. I hope he would have liked it. So as I said, there is a lot that I'm aware of that everything is, is very troubling about technology. AI could kill us. Social media is manipulative. There are all these sort of things that I think are really difficult. But I don't despair because if you bring in artistic expression, I think you're going to be in the right path. This is just a short video that I wanted to play about clouds of procedure. Video, you, it really like makes you think like what's actually going on. So that's all great, but why work in XR? It's so hard. It's so hard. Funding is so difficult, distribution is uncertain you choose to go in it, it's a real heartbreak. But we continue. I put up Martin Scorsese there, because when I started in 2015, I studied filmmaking also at NYU. Um, I thought I was going to be the Scorsese of XR. You know, I might still be, but it doesn't mean anything <laughs> in the way it does. And, but the reason what's exciting that's happening is that when you look at technology's role for impact, you know, it can go either way. Um, really, Obama wouldn't probably be in power if he wasn't able to have micropayments in the internet that he did in 2008. But in the same way, new technologies have, it's a double-edged sword. You know, you have Donald Trump, who is very ingenious with his use of Twitter. Uh, and you could say that without Twitter, there'd be no Donald Trump. So when we do get it right, and it's not always, it's not always possible, uh, we don't always succeed. It is very hard. You are dealing with a new technology. You have to think about stories. You have to think about emotions. You're creating things that have never been created before. But I think we continue, because when we do get it right, and there's a lot of studies, there's a lot of things that have come out, the emotions are deeper, the impact is greater, and the scale is enormous. So just a little bit about, a little bit of the answer of what we think what I think is probably the leading way we can get out of our little technology malaise or anti-technology sort of 
situation that we're in right now that I think has grown increasingly since I started in 2015 working in this sort of field. Um, we really need to get very different people working in these technologies. And Susanna had mentioned who's Metaverse that we're partnering together on. And what that really does is create a community. And it's a community like this one that's incredible. We really need to demystify it. We need other people coming together. Um, these are my OG friends. There are many more. But Chris Milk was a music video director. Nani is a journalist. I was a UN diplomat. Edward Saatchi was in politics. Before we all came together from those diverse perspectives to do and make the exciting world of VR and XR that we're in today. And I think that type of diversity now needs to go to people who are underserved, who are underprivileged. And it shouldn't just be seen as charity. It's a way we actually get to an inclusive future and the way we actually make this work. So you can find out more at whosmetaverse.org. But I wanted to play a little video from Harlem of where we have this pilot project trying to get young people to basically start being the creators today and of tomorrow. And yes, electronic music was my midlife crisis, as, uh, as that soundtrack has it. Uh, just a little bit, uh, I want to, this is my father. Um, he came to this country in the early 70s. Uh, I can't be on the New York Times stage and not think about him. Um, he read the New York Times every day, and that's how he learned English. Um, and he studied and did his graduate studies at NYU. My father, you know, was very important for me um, for many reasons. Um, he was an engineer, but he didn't want me to be an engineer because he said, that's really boring because I didn't come to America for you to do the same thing you would probably have done if we were in India. Because in India, it's a little bit more, some things around caste, but I think a lot of things around just how it works there is much easier to go into the profession of your parents. So when it was time to buy a computer, my dad was very adamant not to get me a computer that would make me into an engineer. He got me a computer that did very little <laughs> and actually uh, had very little like utility uh, and really was more about the vision of humanities and creative expression. And I think my father, I think, really chose well in 1985 when he had to buy our first computer. And though I couldn't do a lot with it, it did something to me. I think the intent, I think the stories we tell around technology really shape how we think about these new technologies. Going forward, you know, people are going to say, spatial computing, good for enterprise, you know, good for this, and it can make this better, and we can tell it to do this, and AI, it can write your decks that you don't want to do, and all the boring things. No, hold on, hold on. Let's put it in a deeper place. Let's put it in a place where we think about our humanity. And look, I know Apple has come out with this announcement that Steve Jobs is dead, so don't count on Apple. And the new Steve Jobs is probably going to be Assad Malik. That's an inside joke. I think, again, how we think about things, how we do it. I mentioned this book that I really like called Age Proof, because you know, as I age, I want to have positive 
things about it. There's a really serious study about how we think about our own aging affects how we function. So this talk, instead of Steve Jobs calling computers the bicycle for the mind, it's the bicycle of the heart. And that's how I am thinking about spatial computing. But you might ask, how do we get there? By the way, I could have filled this entire presentation with anti-VR New Yorker cartoons, because there's quite a lot. I like the New Yorker, but calm down, New Yorker, please. So, you know, it reminds me, you know, I'm also a filmmaker. Uh, a lot of the French New Wave were critics. They started out criticizing how bad movies were. But at some point, they rolled up their sleeves and they started creating. And that's what I think every critic needs to do now because it's become a lot easier and a lot more democratic to get to understand what's happening. And we're, I'm saying this because it really is a whole new frontier now. And just as an example, we need new ways to relate to technology. There was a, a 71 neural net AI that all it had was retina scans of human beings. And with a high degree of accuracy, it could figure out whether that person was a male or a female. It could pick a biological gender from just a retina scan. Now you might say, whoa, whoa. And we have no idea how it did it. It's a black box. You can't reverse engineer the reasoning of AI. So we're entering a whole new way of having to not just have critics, but people need to experiment, need to understand, need to create to change our relationship to technology. We need creative people more than ever. An amazing uh, journalist uh, who, instead of being just a critic, took her adolescent diaries, fed them into GPT-3, and through the chat box function, had a conversation with her inner child. And it's beautiful. That's the type of stuff we need. Because we need to get away from the internet. The internet is flat. The internet, spatial computing is going to make things very different. Right now, it's very hard to know all the different information I get, how to react. How do you bear the toll of flicking through devastation and amusement and messaging and everything? I think there's a lot in spatial computing that's going to make things less flat. So this is a bit of the talk where, in a lightning way, I'll just try to give what I think are some standard sort of rules that I think could be really good. I think that's a cliche to think of technology as a tool. Um, I think we need to think of it in existential terms. In Sartre's Humanism and Existentialism, he says man is not like a hammer. Man's meaning and purpose comes after the very value of his existence. Technology is an extension of us. It is a part of us. It is not something that we're here to use or just to serve us. We have to also realize that a lot of the computers of today, my son, uh, my youngest son, calls my, our iMac a TV. He's like, TV, you know? And that gets me thinking, because you know, a lot of computers today use the design language of TV. But what about books? What about the role of the imagination? And I bring up Werner Herzog, because Werner, and if you message me, maybe I'll give you Werner Herzog's little notes. I've been able to meet and discuss how he feels about emerging technology. He feels that there's no room for imagination. Where is it? We have to design for it. We have to think about it as things become a lot more intense and interactive. So just as a great example, I know it's one of Peabody, and it deserves it very much. Notes on Blindness really does, it's a VR experience that allows for that abstraction, allows for that moment. And with imagination is empathy. That's what you need, and that's what works. So another way, I think, to make technology more human is to do what humans have been doing since the beginning of time, storytelling. Everyone needs to be a creator. A maker knows more than a critic. And finally, 
you know, all of this is like a beautiful James Turrell artwork. I don't know how familiar you are, but it's basically cutting open a circle or a frame to look at the sky as you've never seen it before. Technology can really make us connect and see what's already there and augment it and augment our humanity. But I want to finish on one last thing. Um, and this is Herman Narula's book, Virtual Society, is to don't forget our post-human future. I know it sounds sci-fi, but there will be a time where it won't be too far-fetched, and it's, in, it's an idea in the book that we will have this very difficult ethical dilemma of whether we upload ourselves into a computer and blast it out into the galaxy as the sun explodes behind us. That sounds crazy, but if that is the case, we should make something wonderful. We should make something beautiful. And we should make sure we have a copy of the Unabomber's manifesto. Thank you. So I'm here to introduce our next person who's going to introduce someone. Um, I wanted to come out and say thank you to Chris Severson, who was our curator for the XR for Change Summit to, uh, today. So I would like to uh, have all of us give a round of applause to her. She's done a tremendous job. At, today's going to be inspiring, um, illuminating. And I have to say, Chris is just one of the most nicest people to work with. So please welcome Chris Severson. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So I'm really excited about today's programming because there's so much going on in our world and in emerging tech. I keep thinking back to this one uh, old adage that I always heard growing up, seeing is believing. Think about that. It's just no longer true. That's just one of the things we're going to talk about today in many of the topics. So if you get bored today, you can blame me. If you uh, become concerned or thought-provoked, good. Uh, this is a good, good day to explore a lot of different topics. So I want to thank you all for being here and for caring about these topics of discussion that we're going to have today. And speaking of, our next speaker is Rebecca Barkin, CEO of Lamina One. In this session, Rebecca will explore how decentralization, AI, immersive technologies will shift next-gen experiences in gaming, entertainment, the metaverse, and beyond. So please welcome Rebecca to the stage. Well, hi. Um, I have one big rallying cry, I guess, for all of you today, um, which is, you know, most of you have come here uh, because you care. And, and you care more uh, than your average person about making a big difference. So I am the CEO of, uh, of Lamina One, and today we're going to talk about futurism and emerging tech trends and how they're going to shape, as she mentioned, next-gen experiences in gaming and entertainment, the metaverse, and beyond the metaverse. Quite a word this year. So like I said, you, you're all here because you care not just about having a career of fun or money, but about the betterment of humanity. And humanity has a lot of big questions and challenges in front of us today. Some of you, some of you may know this, this man, but as a leader at the intersection of, of tech and entertainment for the past 20 years, I have seen a lot of hype and hyper hyperbole. A lot of fear and evolution, a lot of changes, uh, in the tech, gaming, and, and entertainment industries. I actually started my career in the music business just as uh, a handful of hackers uh, turned the entire industry upside down. I went to film just in time for it to go through the exact same transition. Um, and then through a series of startups and acquisitions, uh, I spent time at big, big companies like Dell and small companies with big dreams like Nod Labs, which was doing computer vision for tracking, and Magic Leap, uh, which many of you may know, which is uh, an augmented reality company, where I built things like Tenendi, 
uh, which was a collaboration with Sigaras um, and worked with Weta and Royal Shakespeare Company and, and all kinds of great things. And then I went to the jaw-dropping uh, Madison Square Garden Sphere Project, which many of you may be familiar with now. Uh, only in retrospect did all of those sort of zigs and zags of my career make any kind of sense. Um, and only now can I kind of put those cycles in perspective. So last year, I was brought on to lead Lamina One by this man, which is Neil Stevenson. You guys know him? Anybody know him? Yes? Um, so he's an author, he's a futurist, he's also a lifelong gamer um, who originally conceptualized and really articulated and illustrated the metaverse in a way that sort of lodged itself in our subconscious for many years. He did this in his seminal uh, 1992 novel, Snow Crash, which many of you may be familiar with. And his reason was simple. He decided he could either continue to talk about the world uh, that he wanted to enable, or he could help get in the mix and actually build it. And he called uh, me to help him do that. And this is kind of the same choice that I think many of you have made, uh, which is to do it the hard way and to use these things to forge uh, good for the sake of humanity. Uh, since first announcing Lamina One in June of last year, I have to tell you, um, it's been a hell of a market, but um, we've been asked a million times uh, by creators, by maxis on the crypto side, uh, and NVCs too, uh, why the metaverse? Why blockchain? Why now? So for one thing, I think tech and society has finally kind of reached a point where we can bring the next era of gaming and online experiences to life. And that's fueled by major advancements over the last 30 years and graphics cards and spatial computing and virtual worlds, connectivity, et cetera. And we're not just in it to create any metaverse. Not that there's anything wrong with Sandbox and Decentraland and all the other things that we're, we're playing with, but we, were, we are driving a movement to create the open metaverse. So this is a decentralized, interconnected world of virtual experiences, which are increasingly 3D and networked. So not just VR, not just AR, but a really rich, open economy where individuals can enjoy both privacy and prosperity as they move through it. It's kind of a radical position to take in a world full of tech giants. Um, many monopolies uh, that we're seeing the full power of now, massive studios uh, and power centralization. So these three kind of emerging tech trends that we've seen, which we're about to talk about, have together kind of created this perfect storm, which has actually finally enabled us to make Neil's original vision of an open metaverse a reality. Oh look, the plate, okay, there you go. It was a video. <laughs> Okay, so the three themes here is decentralization, which we believe is, is about not just, I mean, many of you probably think of it as maybe blockchain is just crypto for you, so I hope I can dispel some of that today. Um, we see decentralization about being about returning privacy and, and prosperity to, to both individuals and creators. Um, artificial intelligence, obviously this is like the hottest topic of the day, uh, the only thing that VCs are funding. Um, and that's really about you know, embracing kind of efficiency, but making sure that we keep ethics and quality uh, of creative in mind as well. And then this movement towards immersive technology, um, which is really about the resonance uh, and the memory that we can create when we develop multi-sensory and truly connected uh, social experiences. Okay, let's talk about decentralization. Um, so this is really a paradigm shift that kind of started in, well, a little bit before, but really cemented itself in 2009 with Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper, um, which I would encourage all of you to read. Um, it asked a really controversial question among, among many things, but what if users had ownership over their digital assets? What if you could democratize investment um, change the course of money? What about autonomy and privacy instead of large-scale institutions or potentially even predatory kind of platforms taking control? These are important questions in a world where today's mega platforms really 
have the power to, to exploit our identities and personal data, while taking half, and sometimes much more, of creator revenues. So this is kind of, this is the utility of blockchain that we really believe in, right? It's immutability, um, it's total transparency, which is like really relevant when you talk about streaming and whatnot, um, and ownership, true ownership and agency. The capability to really facilitate direct revenues and increase creator revenues, challenge existing distribution models and traditional financing paths for all of your creative projects. I think it's really important to just understand Companies do not love us. <laughs> they can't. Um, we can benefit from capitalism all day long, uh, but we can also demand uh, that it respects us as it evolves. If the money is there and the people are there, it will. Capitalism has always come along and it will continue to come along, but we have to take control. So. As many in the Web3 gaming space know, though, there are many, many challenges to overcome use of blockchain for everyday gamers and creators. So from the perils of, of user onboarding, which truly is horrific, uh, if any of you are playing around with it, but to network congestion and really lackluster narrative development um, and game mechanics, even at times kind of predatory game design, um, there really is kind of a lack of tools and resources out there right now that make entering this world creator friendly at all, let alone consumer friendly. I also think it's worth mentioning, you know, 75% of the, I had a bunch of investors ask me, um, you know, why, like, what happened with web free gaming? Like, we've invested a ton of money in games uh, in the space, and like, none of them have really worked, but why is that? And 75% of the people who are playing web three games are playing as their, their number one motivation is to earn crypto. Which like, if you look at traditional web two gaming, um, the primary motivations really are like joy and stress relief and mental stimulation. So there's just like a total lack of understanding about the kind of motivation and the kind of networking that really builds strong communities um, and what you need from the quality of creative to do that. So I think this is a big kind of turning point for that um, where VCs invested a ton of money uh, in 2021 in a lot of these experiences and they just sort of bought games um, and now are realizing like, oh, all those creatives out there who take a little while to develop like storyboards and concepts and narratives, like they're onto something. That might be why people stick around. Um, so I think like one of the other things that I, we get asked about all the time is like this convergence between uh, AI and blockchain. So moving on to, to AI, a lot of the challenges that we're seeing are made you know, really more pressing by the emergence of artificial intelligence, which to be honest, both threatens and emboldens uh, and empowers creators. Finding that balance is gonna be really difficult. Uh, on the one side, we see AI as an accelerant, right? It can help creators power and really fill in the gaps of like how expensive and how cumbersome it can be to create virtual worlds in the metaverse. Um, from, you know, we're, we've been playing around with AI NPCs uh, and, and how we can enable dynamic content uh, to really empowering also like interoperable gameplay where people can move from one world to another really fluidly with their identity and their assets. AI also offers a lot of customization opportunities, right, for creators and users uh, in virtual worlds. On the other side, uh, AI is, if we're honest about it, uh, threatening the, the ability for creators to actually get paid um, and recognized uh, for their work in very real ways at a time you know, when it really matters most. And this is a threat that could, at least we believe, be partially solved by decentralized technology. It can't solve all of it, but it does um, allow for the recording and the recognition of a purchase of uh, hopefully the weighting, the proper weighting of data and how uh, an LLM serves up any kind of answer to anyone, um, which I think we're seeing right now, there's some real challenges in how we do it. I think it's interesting, like, you know, we've, we've talked about the evolution of chat GPT a lot. Like, you get to 33 trillion inputs, like, and you're not quite sure of the weighting of any of that data in terms of how it's actually decided what answer to serve up to any given individual. 
that's where we start to come in to some real issues. And we also saw with stable diffusion, um, and I don't know how many of you are playing around with some of these tools like mid-journey and stable diffusion, but there was a moment where stable diffusion used to allow you to just put in a really quick prompt and then it was really exciting because like somebody who just had an idea could write five words and then have concept art to get that idea across. But there was a moment where like it used to have a slider where you could actually adjust how how much of a reference you use like on a, on a particular artist. So you could say, give me a girl that's, you know, riding a Harley through, I don't know, the park and uh, in the style of Monet. And then there was a point where it determined that like you could adjust the scale of like more Monet and now add like 20% Picasso and like, wait, hold, hold on, scale that back. Let's add a little bit more of this particular artist. That like sort of slider started to become really slippery territory because now you're like very specifically targeting a certain mix of a specific artist's work. So a lot of these questions, like nothing is solved, but a lot of them are top of mind. And if we don't care, I can assure you companies won't. So I think it's really important that we remain really curious as AI develops and really engaged in the conversation. It's nothing to be afraid of unless we totally disengage from that conversation. Um, so meanwhile, uh, on the immersive front, and I've spent a lot of time in immersive, um, the digital world is, is rapidly becoming more immersive. Everybody we talk to, every brand we talk to is so interested in how to create resonant immersive experiences and really tie together this intersection of physical and digital really seamlessly. Um, and there are major tech companies that are really flooding the market um, and advances you know, in new tech and solutions that, that will very well kind of change the shape of digital and online gameplay and interaction uh, as we know it. And many of you are all of you probably, I would assume, uh, are familiar with the recent headset releases um, from Apple, Meta, Magic Leap. I don't know if anybody's tried the Magic Leap 2. I highly recommend it. Um, but HTC as well, uh, we, who we've been working with on their, on their Viverse, which is a fundamentally interoperable platform, um, have captured a lot of attention uh, in the market. And I think it's also just been a really great sign uh, that both Apple and Disney, if you remember there was this conversation about like, is the metaverse dead? Um, well, it happens like every six months, but uh, in the last six months, uh, it was like, oh, Disney's out, everybody's out, Apple's never coming, and then, and then it came, and both Apple and Disney stood side by side, two market leaders with absolutely unparalleled brand trust and complete ecosystems stood up and said, the work that we're doing in immersive is really important, um, and these technologies are here to stay, so we think that's, that's really great. Um, and the in-game assets, so like NFTs, many of you probably think of NFTs as like some of the kind of, all right, there's a straight up thumbs down in the front row on NFT. <laughs> well, okay, it's fair, there, there's a point there because I, I, I sometimes describe NFTs as like the greatest publicity stunt ever for smart contracts, which is like actually the thing that we care about, right? Which is a technology that should be able to automate and make programmable um, the, the asset itself and like the royalties that should be paid against it, the credits that need to be paid against it, the metadata that's really important to go with it. Like that's what actually really matters. There was just like a really great opportunity for a publicity center around. So sometimes I give some appreciation to it, it's also really kicked our asses, like in terms of the, the market being difficult. Uh, uh, and I think NFTs in general in the market was down about 98% uh, a couple of weeks ago. That doesn't mean anything in terms of like where the technology itself is going. Smart contracts are fundamentally important and they'll be more important. I actually found out the other day, um, because I've, we've been talking with our tech team about it, that they, like, while well, programs like OpenSea and Blur, you know, had come out with sort of this really creator first positioning, um, smart contracts themselves, like, don't actually require that you pay royalties. Um, and it's really technically difficult to do it. And I was like, wait, but that's like the whole premise. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, how did that happen? How is it possible that we have smart contracts that are actually like, quite dumb. They're like the equivalent of a, of a PDF attached to, you know, a, a digital asset. 
and there's no real requirement to pay out uh, the royalties programmatically against those pieces of art. We're hoping to get past that, and there's a lot of people working on how to get past that, but this is, these are some of the things of like when there's a true creator market uh, versus a buyer-seller market or a trade fine market that is sort of like thinly disguised uh, as a creator market by using it as a marketing angle. So we really need real creators in the game uh, that really wanna take charge, take charge of this. Anyway, NFTs. Um, you know, have really been normalized by, by virtual worlds. In Fortnite, we see this UFEN. Um, you know, they're, they're working to embrace these things as well. And Roblox, um, while I have my issues, I won't get into them here, um, is fueling a future of in-game assets. Uh, and, and the NFT market itself is estimated to reach about 15 billion uh, in the next five years. So, you know, we know it's getting interesting. Um, it's getting really interesting. Uh, if you combine all of those technologies together. And we really want to leverage and empower this next generation of immersive content creators to get people to try these new technologies and use them in a responsible way and give really powerful use cases top to bottom. Um, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on this one, but this, this general paradigm shift, right, at the intersection of Web3 and immersive tech and AI is definitely not lost on investors and, and major tech, tech players. Um, and they're beginning, they're, like there's signs of life, they're beginning to re-enter what has recently been uh, a pretty dismal market over the last year. Um, but what gets me up every day as, as the CEO of Lamina One is really the ability to kind of take that interest and transform it into a new online ecosystem for creators and world builders that actually benefits them uh, and actually benefits the individuals and explorers who are interested in that, like long into this emerging online future that we're seeing develop in front of us. This is just a nice brand slide. But um, <laughs> so, you know, to, to succeed, we believe that, you know, all three of these technologies really need to work in lockstep together uh, if we're going to ensure privacy and, and prosperity in that, in that next online era. Um, and that is something that, that we are working on every day with our position at sort of this nexus of, of blockchain, immersive and creator tooling and economics. And we're also, I think it's important, I don't know, if you've played around in the Web3 space, you know that like brand isn't, isn't and, and values, like being values led isn't uh, as common as maybe we're used to in other areas. But we certainly are making an effort to uh, build a really strong brand culture uh, around our creator community and live up to it on a daily basis. And it should not look like Web3. So uh, to dive just a little deeper, I'm not gonna like, this is not a sales pitch, so I'm just gonna cover off on it really quickly. But um, on the tech side, our solution uh, at Lamina One and our belief is really that like when the tech disappears, all that remains is experience. So, our solution at Lamina One is really to be this kind of batteries included blockchain API and creator tooling that is really optimized for ease of use, uh, performance, privacy, privacy, and interoperability. Um, to get there, we provide metaverse middleware that can interact with all EVM chains. Uh, we have an automated setup of the subnet architecture, which is designed for scalability and interoperable game assets uh, and economies. Um, and then really smooth kind of curated integrations that aid creators. So AI, identity, uh, low and no code uh, dev tools, uh, and game engine integrations. So obviously we're hoping to improve the user experience and give, uh, and I think we can do that. We have a lot of people in house that are very much kind of on the consumer grade product design tip. Um, and we really care about this issue of royalty enforcement solutions. So like how do we make sure that there is this uh, immutable record of uh, somebody's contribution to a project and automation of the ability to pay them and at scale. So uh, with it, uh, we've had some great success bringing together um, a, a movement of builders and developers and designers from around the world to create a new online world that truly is by creators and for creators. Uh, a really strong community that sort of empowers each other to build experiences and infrastructure, the kind of infrastructure that we need to ensure the quality and longevity 
of content by putting power back into the hands uh, of those who are building these experiences. Um, you know, I credit that, that community growth in part to the, to the headlines around uh, artist equity and, and the ownership of, of our likeness Platforms that, you know, with the promise of a quick flat buyout uh, have taken our IP and our identities and benefited from that for years. Um, man, I can tell you, I've gone to film festivals and music festivals all around the world and talked to creators, and I can tell you some real horror stories about how mega platforms have abused uh, have abused that with the promise of distribution and really with no alternative method of financing and distribution, then we have, uh, we have a real problem. So we can change it. And we believe that now is the perfect time really to invest in building the open metaverse, uh, only if we do it in the right way. Um, and I just would say, you know, we just have this, win we have this window of opportunity. We gave up a lot around web two um, for global access to information and entertainment. And that was a really exciting period, but to, to really enable that explosion of creativity, again, the kind that gave people the ability to stand up their own digital storefronts and to connect with people all around the world, um, we're gonna need a different take and we're gonna need uh, some different infrastructure. And, and with that, we have the right to really right some wrong, or we have the ability to really right some wrongs uh, in our transition to what we call Web3. Um, I would say, like, if you want to learn more about, about our vision at Lamina, you can always visit our website at lamina1.com. Uh, um, you can join us, you know, in Discord, on our community. We have over 40 that are in there that are having conversations in pretty much every area uh, around development of immersive technology and the metaverse and ownership and IP and royalties and all this stuff. Um, and they're all building solutions really actively and working with each other in an open source way to do that. Um, and I think that's, that's really critical. And I, I would just leave this with you. You know, you all, just even by being here at Games for Change, you are the change makers, right? Like, you know better than anybody that stories are far, far more effective than statistics at moving people in one direction or another. And I think together we can really, if we, if we all really get together, the tech and the creative community, we can use this new technology to bring to life a really robust, uh, fluid, and really wildly imaginative, but also open metaverse. Kind of like the one uh, that my co-founder, Neil Stevenson, imagined so many years ago. So I just wanna say thank you and I cannot wait to see all of your creative experiences. So. We will take a brief break and return to our scheduled programming in five minutes. We will be back in five minutes.
Please make your way back to the theater. Our programming will resume momentarily. Please make your way back to the theater. Our programming is about to resume. And we're back. Uh, new technologies have given way to unforeseen societal changes affecting the way we communicate, connect, and spend time in our day-to-day -day lives. This panel will take a look at the newest influential technologies while discuss discussing the ethics of generative AI, virtual beings, and metaverses. We are going to have, meta as our moderator and uh, founder from Post Reality Labs, Jesse Damiani, along with Deputy Director of the New York Public Library Branch Programs and Services, Dr. Brandy McNeil, Founding General Partner of Endemic Venture Capital, Marina Shihei, Lead Researcher of Tales of Us, Kenneth Norwood, Director of the, Res of the Responsible Technology Team at Amadar, Thea Anderson, plus a very special guest. So welcome to the stage panel. <laughs> Hello everyone, um, thank you for being here. Thank you to Games for Change. Thrilled to be here on the 20th anniversary of a really wonderful organization. Um, today we have a really uh, great panel for you called Brave New World or Better New World, which is um, a sort of a fun way of kind of getting at some ethics and first principles um, when we're looking at these uh, emerging technologies that sort of manifest as buzzwords and takes and all these different sort of competing Ooh. opinions. Um, and so we have four really esteemed humans and, and one uh, <laughs> much, much discussed uh, large language model um, who are gonna be kind of weighing in on, on these issues. Um, my name is Jesse Damiani. I'm a writer and a curator, um, arts and culture advisor of an organization called Protocol Labs, which if you've seen Silicon Valley, the whole build a better internet thing is kind of based on Protocol Labs. So that's kind of more or less what Protocol Labs does. Um, and I also work as a curator at Next Museum, which is a new media museum in Amsterdam. Um, I'm gonna ask each of you to give a little bit of introduction to who you are and a little bit of, about how your work intersects with, with these topics. And uh, Rico, I'll Me first? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, my name is Rico Kenneth Norwood as well too. I am a PhD um, recipient of the University of Southampton. I'm the lead researcher for Tales, a nonprofit storytelling initiative that is international. We are currently building a video game interactive experience for eight year olds and plus that centers ecology through mythology. So we work in places like Brazil, Congo, Romania, and India is our new locality. 
And um, I do a lot of stuff in terms of like reading in our database through notions of like just going through paperwork. AI has kind of integrated in the back end in that way, but we also put together recently a library of myths, which takes over 200 tales from like around the world. And AI definitely helped us in terms of like extrapolating some of these themes, deities and things like that as well, but also humans were helping us as well too. So we used it as a tool to help us like sift through like all this stuff. That's how AI helps me in my job, pass. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Sagitamu. My name is Marina Shihei. Uh, my family comes from the Pueblo of San Ildefonso and I'm married into the Pueblo of Villa in Northern New Mexico. Um, I've been in tech for about 20 years in all sorts of capacities. Right now, I serve as a general partner to Endemic Venture Capital, which is a venture studio building indigenous-led climate tech and tribal gaming future products. Um, I also serve as a special advisor to President Von Sharp with the World Economic Forum, looking at the future for indigenous peoples, as well as um, lots of work with the UN and tech policy. You know, what happens when AI goes rogue? What do we do with killer drones as, as humanity? <laughs> um, and looking at that, uh, that also under what, what happens through um, our tri sovereign tribal nations. So thank you and on to the next. Okay, I'm Dr. Brandy McNeil. I am the deputy director for the New York Public Library. Um, I have also been on the Public Library Association's board. I just got done doing that. Um, I'm also a writer and the way in which libraries show up in this space is through lifelong learning. That has been a mission of most libraries across the US. And so we do that in a variety of different ways. So when I think of what we do at the New York Public Library, we have programs such as Project Code. Project Code has been able to partner with large giants such as Google and Microsoft and uh, MIT. And so we have been able to create ways in which we can ensure that marginalized communities are not left behind in this tech space. We do things like tech talks, where we bring in people who are creating NFTs that look like the people that come into our libraries. We also have partnered with Apple to create app development programs, and we just recently had a hackathon, and that hackathon was about really helping um, people who have disabilities, and so people were creating apps that would help people with disabilities. So that's some of the work we do. Hi, I'm Thea Anderson. I'm on the responsibility, uh, responsible technology team at Omidyar Network. Omidyar Network is a social responsibility firm uh, funded by Pierre Omidyar, who is the original founder of eBay. We do grant making and investments. I primarily focus on ethics in technology, though it evolves and it changes depending on the different issues in the technology sector. Um, but it always, underlying always ends up focusing a lot on ethics in the space. Um, and right now quite a bit uh, is focused on a concentration of power in the technology space. AI has always been an issue, but it seems to be evolving <laughs> much more as, as the interests grow quite a bit as well. Um, other issues focusing quite a bit now is around issues around disinformation online, especially around content moder moder uh, moderation. Um, especially growing in the gaming space. We hadn't really been working in that space, um, but I've been pushing it very, very hard, and now we're, we're starting to move more in that space. I think more there's a recognition um, that's been so wonderful to hear over the last couple of days is just that tech obviously is being tested on the gaming infrastructure, but that this is where culture is also being tested to some extent. So mm. it's been really empowering <laughs> to hear this over the last couple of days. Mm. Thank you all. Um, just a kind of um, uh, housekeeping note, um, I, the, the, some of these questions are going to be a little bit more scripted than I normally like to be, in part because I'm trying to uh, be fair and be machine readable to, to our large language model friend. Um, so just <laughs> if you see me typing on the computer at yeah, some point while we're, <laughs> while we're talking, I'm not intending to be rude to anybody. Um, it's just the nature of the, the pan on me as the, as the sort of machine surrogate. Um, so the first part of the conversation, um, we're really going to be looking at this kind of buzzy and contentious term of the metaverse, um, which has been uh, sort of on top of people's minds since 2021, since it first kind of started reappearing uh, in clubhouse uh, houses and, and sort of ultimately by the fall, uh, Facebook changed their name obviously to meta. We all, all know this at this point. Um, but even going back, um, thinking back to um, Rebecca's 
uh, keynote, even going back to 1992 with Snow Crash, the metaverse was always tied to gaming and gamification. Um, so kind of, I wanna get perspectives from each of you um, as you're thinking about the metaverse becoming a more pervasive aspect of daily life in society. Um, I have sort of different questions that I'm gonna be, be throwing to each of you. So um, Dr. McNeil, I'd love to start with you. Um, as someone whose work is directly connected with the public, how are you thinking about access to the metaverse and other emerging technologies? What steps do you think we should be considering to ensure that the metaverse is as inclusive as possible? Are there factors interfering with some folks being able to access them? How might we better use the educational capacities of emerging technologies? That was a lot of questions. I don't do well when I get a lot of questions at one time. <laughs> um, what I will say is um, how libraries are looking at the metaverse, we're using it. Um, but it's also for us um, learning and learning ways in which we can explain it to people who are coming into our libraries, um, especially because it's not necessarily the first thing that people are thinking about, uh, especially in New York City. A lot of people are struggling to pay their rent. A lot of people are struggling to actually feed their families. So they're not thinking about, oh, let me jump into this metaverse and do this thing. However, we also have the flip side where we see it helping people. So a good example is um, we have been doing gaming in a variety of different ways. And when you have a vet who comes in who was in a particular war, who is now introduced to gaming because of us and now doesn't feel as isolated at home, then we feel like that's a win, right? That's a mental health win for us. And so we're doing um, a lot of things in terms of how do we educate people about it? How do we show them what the uses are of it? But we also need to show them the pros and cons, right? That misinformation is a huge part of being able to explain to people what is it, how do you stay safe in this environment? And so that's some of what we've been doing in that space. Amazing, thank you. Um, Marina, you've referenced the importance of cyber sovereignty. And by the way, with these questions, Answer the parts that, that you want. We'll see how the GPT <laughs> responds. Um, you, uh, you've referenced the importance of cyber sovereignty in the indigenous metaverse. Can you share a bit about those and your work on both? How are you thinking about relationships to and with technologies in ways that avoid digital colonization, preserve indigenous IP, and foster non-Western perspectives, values, and stories? Gosh, that's a broad question. <laughs> a series of questions. Um, so first of all, I, I do have an afternoon talk that I'm gonna be talking a little bit deeper on cyber sovereignty, but the idea that indigenous nations here in the US and in Canada and in many other countries um, have independent sovereignty, um, we're able to assert those rights into cyberspace and necessitate government to government relationships, negotiate cyber treaties, create our own re regulatory environments, um, and look at things from our own people-centered and, and healthy perspective, as opposed to like a, a corporate and consumer-centered perspective, which we have um, here in the US. And so that is really critical for us to develop technologies that you know, reflect our worldview and our perspective. Um, the easiest way that I, I like to talk about you know, what indigenous culture is, is that we're relational people to each other, to time and space and place, and it's very difficult to synthesize that with a Western worldview. So right now, like, you know, technology looks one way and it interacts one way, but as that grows you know, in adoption and um, development from indigenous peoples, we're going to see very radically different ways to interact with that. Um, and one, one of the things that I always like to reference is you know, how language shapes the world around us and our perceptions of it. Um, an example of this in, in my Taylor language is um, the way that we talk about our younger siblings. The word is tiu, which means seed. It's the same word as seed. And we have this beautiful relationship with farming and like how we interact with our food ways. And also like understanding that you know, we have that responsibility to each other to nourish and grow and you know, help. Um, and that's not there if we speak English or you know, some of these other languages. So um, when we're crafting that metaverse, when we're interacting with culture, you know, it, there's ways to help bring people who you know, were not immersed in that worldview into you know, perceiving the world the way that we do. And then also having access to some, some of the, the, the more public <laughs> 
there, there's a, some, uh, something called the cultural iceberg theory, right, where you see the top of the iceberg, but it's like very deep. And, um, you know, we can, we can share some of that without being very explicit, and I think that's really beautiful. Um, we can also use this to power our tribal nations economically and do so in a way that's remote, that keeps our people close. Um, and one of the things that I've been exploring with my venture firm, um, which everything is very proof of concept right now, and I'm, I'm very lucky to live at a time where I can do that. And one of the things that we're working on is making sure that anything that's cultural intellectual property is not is, is known that it is a, a cultural ownership, right? It's owned by, by our, our past generations and our future generations, and that's not something that is saleable, it's not something to be taken. Um, and that's really concerning also when we talk about, you know, chat GPT and, you know, the evolutions of AI scraping data, because if we are protective of that, that cultural ownership, and even if we create guidelines around that, are we making sure that other people are abiding by those guidelines in an ethical way? Absolutely. Um, Rico, you you've know. been a gamer since you were young. How does that impact your thinking about the metaverse? Being both an academic and a gamer, what perspectives do you think are important now that folks who weren't gamers before are taking an interest in the metaverse? Are there lessons or insights you could share, particularly regarding ethics and first principles? Um, you've spoken about not falling into techno-determinism, for instance. Why is that important to you? Um, yo, so like, <laughs> I always start with the tagline that um, gamers have been in the metaverse before the metaverse was a thing. And I think that we live in this time where the metaverse has been like utilized as this gap to bridge between those who didn't game or didn't understand game or who were afraid of it and sell it into a package that ground like people have different definitions of like what the metaverse is. Yeah, because it's a video game and they just don't want to say it. And like it's wild to me kind of like when kids were in Penguin World, they were in the metaverse. Like when we're in Grand Theft Auto V, we're in the metaverse. Like when I'm owning my nightclub and shipping my cocaine business in Grand Theft Auto V, I'm in the metaverse. <laughs> like all these things are happening. There's like actual exchange of finances there and stuff like that as well too. And I think it's a way to bridge the gap, but it's a very nefarious way to kind of like talk about something that's already existed. Because as you said, like people disappear in these like co-opting of these spaces as well too. And then they forget about kind of like what was already there and then they repackage it as if it's something as well new. But in terms of like the ethics and stuff like that, I think it's something that is really like, you know, video gaming was a space for me to find not only safety, but myself, my gender journey, my sexuality journey, and like just like learn about the world. And I think like when you're talking about the library and stuff like that, that's such a powerful thing to have in a modern city. Cause you know, when we went to the library, all we had was like art, where like paint 2.0, right. and that was about it. But to be able to go to the library and then connect with other people in the virtual realm that you know, like maybe we might not have the finances to have a swimming pool in our house or something right. like that, but hey, I can swim with you in this virtual place. Okay. And I think the connective aspect of that, like with our game and stuff like that as well too, connecting children from the Congo or connecting children from Brazil and things like that in World of Us, it's a valley, I always like, it's a decolonial Roblox. Like I literally say that sometimes too, but like think about it, if Roblox was like this decolonial anti-racist, like, you know, like indigenous centered space where people really went into and got understanding like these structural things about the world and cultural heritage and sharing and just learning like, this is like actually the benefits of like creating spaces like this in a digital realm versus, you know, like us doing Zoom meetings in 3D with Mark Zuckerberg and like <laughs> stuff like that as well, too. But I mean, like that's at least what I got from gaming in terms of like the metaverse conversation and like what I think also is missing from it. This need to make a common space for everybody to come to, to have access to, to trade and just to restart over from what we have right now. So, yeah, love that. Thea, your work spans a range of different uh, areas under the umbrella of responsible technology, from encrypted messaging to the fair data economy to new creator economies. Some people cite the metaverse as an evolution of the web as a kind of shorthand. If there's truth to that, what do you see as priorities we should be considering across policy, enterprise, and investment? Yeah, I mean, just building on what Rico was saying, it's even where I work, like some people use the word metaverse, some people don't, and I don't even really bother because again, it's, it's yeah, <laughs> you spend a lot of time just like discussing it. So, I think the way I would even even taking a step back, no matter if we use that term or not, I would say, you know, working for a philanthropy, what role should philanthropy even play at all in technology as well, like ethically? Um, so the way I look at it is, 
there's rules, power, and ideas, right? And so potentially where should philanthropy engage? So in a sense of rules, thinking about checks and balances, thinking about governance, power, who makes the rules, and then potentially ideas, like who's actually thinking 20 years in advance, 50 years in advance. So when I think about issues around the metaverse, using that term exactly, like where like I'm directly supporting is a lot of like badass gaming attorneys who are focusing on issues around like IP. And again, they're ones, they're ones that potentially would not have invo involved in like what the web looks like today. So again, and ideas as well as, um, yeah, people that wouldn't necessarily even have, quite honestly, cash flow to necessarily be at conferences that wouldn't necessarily be at that. So some of it's at the very, very basic level. Um, but again, I think for me, it's more of ethics, like what role should philanthropy even be playing in a lot of these spaces? Um, other than, yeah, making sure the right people are where they need to be versus me being sitting at that table speaking for people. But. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if we could get the uh, screen up. Oh, Jesus. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I started prompting and I think uh, I might have to prompt it to be a little bit more uh, brief in its responses. <laughs> um, but um, so I started with the overall framing with the metaverse um, and asked what um, ethical considerations we should consider. And um, w what we can do is uh, we can make these available somewhere else. I'll, I'll talk to the Games for Change team so that we're not spending all of our time reading, but I'll just kind of blow through these, these, um, numbered, these numbered sort of pieces. So privacy and data protect protection, accessibility and inclusivity, digital ownership and intellectual property, digital addiction and mental health, online harassment and safety, uh, digital divide and economic inequality, virtual crime and security, algorithmic bias and AI ethics, regulation and governance, and, and environmental impact. Uh, and so I'll read its conclusion. In conclusion, the metaverse presents exciting possibilities for human interaction and experience but it also brings forth a host of ethical challenges. By considering these first principles, we can work towards building an inclusive, secure, and responsible metaverse that enhances human life without compromising our values and well-being. How do we think about that? That was mm. nice. Diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, I didn't see any gaming or anything like that, and it literally is all too. And then, like, diversity talks kind of, or we're in, or inclusion, or like, but equality is often conflated with equity as well, yep. too. Mm. So, yeah, they might be talking about like equality in there, but sometimes we need to be talking about equity yeah. as well. Right. So, um, nah, you need to do some more work. Yeah. <laughs> do some more homework. Yeah, do some more homework, ChatGPT. <laughs> um, so, I'm going to. I'm gonna let us sit with all that stuff, um, but not, not do any more <laughs> reading for the moment. Um, I also wanted to have us spend a little bit of time um, talking about this burst of uh, activity around generative AI. And just for some context from, from sort of my position, I'm using the term AI. I don't necessarily agree that it's the term we should be using, and I know that there are others that feel that way, uh, but it's the sort of the term that we have to discuss this topic, so that's, that's why we're using it. Um, but we've seen this rise of um, text-to-image uh, diffusion models like Midjourney, um, like DALI, um, and we've also seen the rise of large language models um, like GPT-3 and GPT-4, which power the chat interface, chat GPT. Um, and it's easy to get whiplash when we're seeing these sort of different kind of takes. It's either gonna you know, be the uh, this crazy existential risk, or it's going to solve every uh, problem in, in, in healthcare and medicine. Um, but so I wanted to take a moment for us to kind of like cut through a lot of that noise and, and really get to the, the signal. So I guess as a, as a broad open question that we can kind of popcorn, um, when you think about the rise of publicly accessible generative tools, what ethical considerations come to mind? Like... So these generative tools have become available to the public, even though we've been interacting with AI in various ways, whether we knew it or didn't know it. I think that there is regulation that is needed when things go to extreme, like deep fakes and stuff like that as well, in terms of like taking somebody's image through collective stuff off the internet and literally like posing as them in online spaces. Um, and then it's like, but that's me going to the extreme of humanity versus like the unextreme of humanity where literally chat GBT is used to spell check an email sometimes for people who may have like dyslexia like me or something like that. And then it's like, 
you know, the balance between the extreme and the non-extreme is where we need to kind of sweet spot when we talk about it. I don't like to do a fear-mongering kind of like, not to say this is a fear-mongering conversation, but I don't like to start fear-mongering conversations with um, generative AI because they did the same thing with video games in the 90s. Mm. And they did the same thing with media in the 90s as well too. Like they're coming for our children, da 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 The Haynes Code Act is nothing but like them fear-mongering people against like films and stuff like that. You know, if you're in the bed with a woman, make sure you have one foot on the ground. You know, like these are, things that history has repeated over and over and over again. And for some reason, they always weaponize children in the middle of it, like AI is coming for your kids. Like, well, no, not all of them, but you know, like none of them hopefully as well too. But <laughs> you know, like, um, that presentation from yesterday. Um, no, but like, I think like, you know, we need to find a balance between regulations, but also allowing people to be in creative spaces like this as well too but also the fear of like it taking from creative people's jobs as well. Yep. You know, like there's gender AI that people are relying upon to do work or do CGI graphics and stuff like that in the film industry and stuff like that. And that's a very scary thing. I met um, one dude, he used to carve, and this was back when I was living in New York, um, working in Michael's Frame and Art in Chelsea on 23rd, um, literally the hustle. Um, he used to carve cars for companies like out of clay. But eventually he didn't have a job anymore because eventually like stuff like 3D printing and 3D design came in. So how do we not use these tools to obsolesce human beings, but how would you use these tools to like, you know, like help and aid us? Mm -hmm. Because I mean, like there's nothing replacing humans. Like as much as we wanna do that workforce leaders, there's nothing that can literally replace us. We're so dynamic in so many ways. And an AI model, as you just, kind of showed off, it can't be as dynamic as a human being can, if that makes sense. So just that balance between like regulations and freedom, mm -hmm. like that sweet spot is what I look for. Mm -hmm. So I agree, I think, I think I'm caught in the middle of like it being great and it being horrible, right? And so when I think of the services that we offer at the library, right? One of the things is we have a studio where people can come in and express themselves creatively. Um, and we have some people who come in and they are trying to get employment as voice over actors. Mm -hmm. And when I look at certain AI apps that are now able, such as um, a specific company who's creating uh, books that people can write, it's great for indie authors because you're able to now create books and have it out there, but then they also are embedding this audio model which once again is great. It means that more people will have access to books that they've never had. On the flip side, that voiceover actor, whose voice is amazing, that they can just replicate mm -hmm. what happens to his employment, what happens to the path he's going down. So I think about some of that. I also think about that whole equity lens, and I think that's part of what we are trying to instill and make sure does not happen to a lot of the communities that we see that come into yeah. our library systems because we know we have to explain to people so that that fear mongering that's happening, hold on, calm down, let's, let's, let's kind of go through what this all means. Let's give you a little bit of understanding of what it can do, how you can play with it, give you a safe environment to play with it, and then maybe you, you know, expound on that in another way. Yeah. But I think it doesn't mean that there aren't things happening. When I think of the deep fakes, literally me and my son have a password so that if he ever gets that call and it sounds like mom, who is like, oh my gosh, I need you to sell me X, Y, and Z amount of money, we can know whether or not it is us because we've had it happen. And I think sometimes it's like, it's happening to people. We see a bunch of older adults who come into our libraries who have had all types of scams happen to them because they're just not able to keep up with all the different ways that things are happening to them. Mm. And so, you know, that's why I think I'm caught on both sides because I'm seeing what happens and what comes through. Mm. And so with the libraries, we're really trying to make sure that we can inform people. We're trying to make sure that with the equity lens, people aren't left out to be creators. Exactly. You don't know what an NFT is, we'll tell you what it is. We'll tell you how you can create it. We'll give you digital art classes that help you to figure out how do you create that thing that you can put on so that you too, if you decide, I mean, you might not be able to afford it anymore, at least not in very much. Um, <laughs> 
but if you wanted to buy real estate and you're like, you know what, I can't get the house over here anymore because that's unattainable, well, maybe I can get it in the metaverse. Mm. But if you don't know how to do that, that's why we have the library. <laughs> um, the library. So, so building on this, um, not only is their radical potential to exacerbate inequalities, but um, to reinforce stereotyping and perception bias. Mm. Um, like I've, I've generated, you know, like, like Pueblo women doing this. <laughs> and you know, it spits out some just like nonsensical thing. Like the things that we wear are very like culturally informed. They're very specific, they, they're very meaningful. And you know, it's spitting out like random things. And you know, if, if you're not in a, in a culture or a community, you might not know what those things are and you might not know the difference. Um, but it can create really challenging perception biases and also inappropriate things in that way. Um, but also looking at, you know, reviewing job applications or college applications or philanthropy, right? Like, like Native Americans get 0.2% of all philanthropic money, right? So what is that AI going to do when they get an application from a Native American organization? It's gonna automatically exclude because they don't give money to that, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, we run a lot of really big challenges in exacerbating social inequality, um, you know, financial inequality, all, all of these things. But in addition to that, um, there's just a, an incredibly dark potential for the increasing of radicalization. And we've seen that online in the US, in our political systems. We've seen people storm our government buildings. And, um, you know, that is going to continue to get bigger and deeper. And we collectively need to not only invest in media literacy, but in, you know, policy guidelines that are, you know, healthier for, for yeah. all of us and our young people who are, you know, maybe going into the metaverse just to play and then, you know, meeting somebody who's teaching them, you know, whatever perspective. So mm -hmm. those are things that I think. Can I just add one thing onto that? Yes, I agree. I am mad at the Barbie <laughs> app filter mm. that literally oh gosh. would not keep my skin what yeah. I needed my skin to be. So mm. just wanted to plug yeah. that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would just say a few things. Um, I mean, again, I think I'm excited about lots of pieces, but again, it's that tension. I guess on the, on the regulatory environment, I think my question is, I think there's a huge rush to regulate. It's like, well, my question is, are some of the laws that we already have, let's, are they sufficient? Because mm. some of them aren't. So it's like just adding more, I don't think is necessarily what we should be doing, EU. You know, so like, that's, I think that's one piece of it. Um, I think another thing too is again, going back to concentration of power, there's a lot of huge companies that are just growing and growing and growing. Mm. Um, so again, one of, the, you know, one of the things we also do, I think we're very lucky to work at a foundation that can actually fund strategic litigation. So for example, like Clearview AI, we're actually allowed, we're funding them, we're funding actually a lawsuit against them in California and we're using that with, um, with the California Privacy Law Consumer Protection. I don't know if they'll win. It's actually, it's again, um, the, the plaintiffs are some uh, Black Lives Matter activists and a couple of other um, grassroots activists, again, linked to the Clearview AI using surveillance and biometrics. Um, I don't know if they'll win, but the point of it is setting that precedent, and it's really to also test those laws. And I think more and more is going to be specific companies using AI. So again, part of it is also, it's very early days, so I'm excited that we're able to do that. We're also starting to do that um, in the EU, and it's very much linked to issues around, um, um, I think building on what you were saying around um, automatic uh, wage discrimination as well. Because one thing I look at it too is that things are moving so fast and there's a lot of focus around like the output, which is the data, and there's not enough focus for lots of reasons, like on the process, which is like algorithm. So again, it's not just strategic, uh, litigation, which is not always a solution, but if we can also, how do we stop some of that data being collected and take a step back? I think that also can be very useful. But again, that's very difficult um, to do quite yeah. often. Do, do any of you, um, are there examples, like we've, we've referenced some of the examples, the Barbie app, Clearview AI, um, where maybe things have uh, gone in unethical or frustrating directions. Are there any examples that come to mind that you're currently seeing or have seen where generative AI has been used in a way that, that feels right and feels ethical and feels productive? Like, I can talk to it about in terms of like some of the work that we're doing at Tails in the background, especially like with the Library of Myths. 
So like I was saying, like it's like 200 myths from like all these localities that we're like shifting through with like different themes, mythologies, deities, like like all these characters and stuff like that. And of course, like people, some like a part of our team, they manually read through all of these in their native tongue and then like translation models as well too. But literally the database that they have put together, it allows us to go in and literally like filter through all these stories. So if I wanna find a story that's based out of Congo that deals with like um, making over the world or something like that, or like how the sun was born or something like that, I can literally put it in the filtration system mm. and see it and it brings it to me or other stories that are like that. Maybe I want something about like gender empowerment in this native story. Literally, it will put stories together from all these different localities so you can see the bonds that they actually have in them. And these are like great ways that it's been used, even in my personal work and stuff like that, right? Like literally being an academic, they always like, just read the first line and keep going, just read the first line and keep going. Like, no, like read it though. But literally just going over reading all my own work and then like kind of like using it to sum up some of the points and other things as well too, but comparing them both as like an extension tool. Mm. I think it's great because it's like, you know, we do so much nowadays and it's like a one person journey, like especially like I meet some people who um, they need to get grants written and stuff like that. And there's like a formula to writing a good grant. Like, you know, like, and if you don't know that formula or if you don't have the money to pay somebody to do that formula for you, why wouldn't I go to chat? I was telling somebody like, girl, if you don't pull up chat GBT and ask it, you know, like, <laughs> like that's literally a tool to empower you to get the grant money so you can, you know, go publish this graphic novel that you're talking to me about. Because I mean, like, she can't afford to like pay somebody to write her grants for her. And like the knowledge to do that is also he say, she say, or they say, or like, you know, like it's in areas of like nepotism that sometimes people of color or marginalized identities cannot access as well. I wish I had one that could put together a PhD proposal for me mm -hmm. when like back then when I was applying, I was literally just like, shopping around getting it back like da, da 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 you know like these very formulaic things like I think are the ways they kind of like leverage the divide a lot to me like where people didn't have access to pay somebody to do it for them that admission scandal yep. yeah like stuff like that and, you know like stuff like that so I mean like I see the power in things like that for mm -hmm. in generative AI if that makes sense the question yeah I would even say within libraries you know one of our biggest challenges is that we have people coming from all over um, who speak various different languages. I mean, our ESOL programs alone can have over 51 countries in one class with 30 something languages, right? And so people have to navigate to get into the library to get the services they need. This then means if you don't have someone at, say, that service desk that speaks that language that can start to help and guide people to that, how do you help them? And so this is where AI comes in. This is where how can we use AI for the good in order to help with things like that? How do, you know, one of the biggest things that I think about when I think of some of the ways in which we are not doing things right is that everything is automatically, you're already opted in. Like we need to be able to just opt, we're already, like we need to be able to opt out, <laughs> right? Like, but have that be first. I wanna decide that I wanna do this thing or be in this thing or have you take my information or scrape my information for the use of whatever service. And I think that's not happening and that causes a bunch of issues. But from the greater good, I mean, I think there's, there's tons of ways that AI is truly helping us. Um, you know, we're looking at it for cataloging. Um, so I think, you know, with our collections, there's a lot of different ways that we can use AI in libraries, but really it's for the connection for us. It's mm -hmm. able to do that. Obviously, things like being able to help people who are, so we have tons of people. We have a career services department. We have tons of people who come in who need resume help. Yeah, we literally sure. can't sit with every single person coming in that door if there's a way that there's something that we can use to kind of help them, to guide them, to get them at least to that point. Because a lot of people are, you're coming at the last minute, I need that resume right now, I'm about yes. to go to the interview. And we're like, I don't even know you, your background, like, how am I gonna help you? Well, this is a way that it can help us, mm. right? But we've gotta be cautious. Libraries are very sensitive about privacy, mm. very. So that means even when we're thinking about, you know, whose technology or whose platform we're going to use to do some of this type of stuff, what are they doing? Where are they getting the information from? 
right? Is there copyright infringement? Who's gonna be held liable? Because we don't wanna be, so. Mm. Um, so f the, the examples that I think of very prominently for me is one, emphasizing what Rico had said about, um, you know, just making up for the fact that we're consistently under resource in organizations and you know, tribal governments. <laughs> like this, this has made, to me, it, it has the potential to make tribal governments, you know, 10 times more effective because they just don't have the, the HR capital, right? Like we're still recovering from the human capital loss of colonization and we, we probably will be forever. <laughs> but you know, in, in terms of that, like we just don't have enough people to produce the amount of work that we have to do to just exist. So you know, that's, that's really incredible to have tools like this that help us do that better um, because that helps you know, our, our cultural survival. It helps us you know, fight back against cultural genocide and it allows us to preserve our life ways which you know, better everybody <laughs> because we, we do retain some, some of that continuous knowledge. But in addition to that, you know, when we have people who are from very like, closed cultures and don't always interact outside, you know, it's really difficult to do that code switching. And so this, these tools can you know, take you know, a general idea and put it in terms that they just might not have access to and might not have had you know, the personal and professional coaching come into a community. So these are incredible to me in bridging some of those just social divides. Um, yeah, excellent. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I would just say, I mean, one thing just on a personal level, like my mom is blind, and I think I see a lot of opportunities, and she's not particularly tech savvy, so I think, I do think, I hope, that's an easy way as well for her to just be able to speak and do, you know, moving forward with a lot of different pieces where like, right now it'd be too difficult. And then, yeah, so that's I think one of the main things mm, that I see mm. like, on a personal level. I was about to say one more thing. Um, if you live in a foreign country, AI is great because you can translate everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm always in the store, in Germany, just looking at the labels like, what the heck, is this butter or <laughs> like something else? I'm like, okay. Or when you get a scary German letter and you don't, and it's just about like signing up for like a cell phone bill. Yeah, that helps too, the translation thing, like you said. So yeah. <laughs> um, I had wanted to, uh, to, to ask our, our pal here, but um, <laughs> the, the interface to access ChatGPT has, has sadly uh, died. Um, so <laughs> it's just us, it's just us for the last five minutes. Um, and with that, I just wanted to kind of extend this, this last line of conversation, which is, you know, the, the title of the panel is Brave New World or Better New World. Right. Brave New World, I'm surely, surely all of you know, but about 90 years ago, um, uh, this book, Brave New World, sort of imagined a dystopia where, um, you know, there was opt-in surveillance and distractions were keeping us from, you know, leading meaningful lives. Um, and so it's, it's kind of eerie some of the ways in which some of the sort of predictions in that book proved, proved prescient. Um, but maybe to like leave us on this kind of note of thinking about the um, examples and ideas that are bringing us toward this better new world, and you know, I know that better can be a fraught term, and new world can be a fraught term, and um, you know. But for the for the for the sake of um, sort of brevity in the discussion, how do you, what do you see as being things that could steer us in the direction of better new world versus brave new world? I mean, the first thing I think about is digital literacy. That's got to be the main thing because I think a lot of people feel like everybody's on the internet, everybody has access and everybody's doing the thing and it's not. Um, you know, we still have people who we have in our classes that we're explaining some of the basics and I think um, it's important that digital literacy play a huge role so that the equity can happen. Um, and I think that is what will help us to get to a better because when everybody can be involved in what happens, then we have a better. Mm. So I've had some really incredible conversations over the course of this conference. And um, I really believe the cultivation of empathy for those of us who are in the business of developing these technologies is the most important thing. Um, I, I met a gentleman who developed a game called Never Alone, which probably many of you know. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just absolutely incredible to me how thoughtful and, you know, being driven by indigenous protocols in collaboration that this 
this game was created and it, you know it it was really just even moving to to know that somebody cared enough to do that and so for for people in this room who are in that industry or, or watching wh wherever this is distributed, um, you know, it's really important for us to be listening to each other and learning from each other and hearing these different experiences because that can guide generations of people interacting with these technologies um, to learn how to interact with each other and the world around us in a lot better ways. It was the first game we played on our Twitch show. Uh, it's <laughs> amazing, it's amazing. Like, we literally it's reference it all the time story. in our process. <laughs> Um, what can get us to a better world? That's what the question was. Mm -hmm. um, not centering white folk in every conversation that we have um, as a start. <laughs> um, access, leveling the playing field, starting over, not having a seat at a table, but breaking the table apart and starting it, a new table. You know, like literally like all these things of like digital literacy, like empathy, access, like all these things are literally just unlearning so many processes of structural damage that have happened to us over years and years and years. And I do believe it's just a resetting that we really have to do. And how we get to that reset is through like learning these processes and unlearning these processes. Like, you know, like me and us and doing the video game, we were doing this one thing where we were talking about like, yeah, we're gonna put in a, a collection system and stuff like that in the inventory. And some of our junior researchers were like, well, you know, inventories perpetuate capitalism. And I was like, well, no, we're not selling nothing to nobody. You know, you're just collecting. Like, but no, Rico, they perpetuate capitalism because you have to collect things for yourself. And so it was an interdisciplinary approach where we all listened to each other. And they was like, well, what if we collect things to progress the world together, mm. not just the player? Right. And it was like these ingenious things that, like, I would have never thought about that because I was in my own world and not like bringing these other perspectives in. And literally just like decentering these dominant ideas and conversations and starting over with something that could be revolutionary, new, impactful, and radical. And I'll just, that's mine. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, that's a perfect building. Stop clapping on Because I was going to say worker power. I mean, really. And to me, I think one of it is supporting unions is a huge piece and really is supporting, um, I would say actually youth-led change, but really youth-led change, not 32-year-old youth-led change. <laughs> um, and really youth-led movements. And yeah, and really youth-led building a new economy. Um, I think those are the big piece. And yeah, tech can be a, a part of that, so obviously a lot of it's gonna be on tech platforms, but it has to be worker power to me. Love it. What an incredible conversation. Thank you all so much. And thank you all. Um, thank you. We will be back in five minutes to resume our programming. We'll be back in five minutes.
please make your way back to the theater. Our programming is about to resume. Please make your way back to the theater. Our programming is about to resume. Hello, everybody, again. If you've ever wondered how content moderation works in virtual worlds, you're in the right place. In this next session, legal expert and senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, Britton Heller, will help us gain insight into the unique ways moderation works in 3D, how this impacts the privacy and safety rights of gamers, and what developers need to know to be successful. So please give a warm welcome to Britton. Thank you for having me here today. Let's start with a story. Who here has heard of Lego Universe? Okay. Lego Universe was a highly anticipated massive multiplayer online game like Roblox or Minecraft. That ended up being shuttered. The original idea for the experience looked great and the company wanted to give users the opportunity to use LEGO components to build their own worlds. Given how utterly trusted the LEGO brand was by parents, the company was also committed to robust content moderation. But if you study content moderation like I do, you're familiar with a kind of spicy term called time to penis. And what I mean by time to penis is what is the actual interval it takes between a user entering a world and people starting to draw phalluses in the environment. So what was the time to penis for this world? Well, often it's not very long, all puns intended. Um, <laughs> Lego needed to, amongst other things, prevent users from publishing environments with adult content in it. And it intended to whitelist content, so to review things beforehand before putting it into the world. Ultimately, they found that this was not going to be possible. There was no way to create an automated, scalable, economical way to prevent users from creating adult content in their creations. It became a wide-scale problem and was ultimately what sank the project. Now, this is not an unusual story. Most companies find that their expectations about governing and moderating user behavior in spatial computing are turned on their head. My name is Britton Heller. I like to describe myself as the lawyer of the black mirror. I teach at Stanford. I'm a visiting fellow at the Virtual Human Interaction Lab, and I, I look at how we are gonna prepare for a post-cell phone future. Today, I wanna talk to you about how content moderation works and how it's different when we move from a flat screen to an XR environment. There are three takeaways that I think you should take, take away from this talk today. 
First, immersive media is different. It is different than social media. And this is because it has a different impact on our bodies and on our minds. Two, for all of the engineering nerds in the room, the different tech stacks mean that there are different layers of enforcement for content moderation in XR. And for all the rest of us, number three, AI will not save us here. So number one, this is not social media, this is immersive media. And the difference is very, very important. It is a mistake to treat immersive technologies like new forms of pre-existing social media. And this is because XR environments have different psychological and neurological impacts on their users. It is not like socializing in video gamed worlds. It is not like interacting on social media. When you study immersive worlds, there are three characteristics that we look to to determine how immersive an environment is. I like to use the acronym PI to remember them all. First is presence. Presence has been studied in communications departments for decades. And it's formally known as the illusion of non-mediation. In normal speak, this means when XR is done right, you don't see the gadgets. There's, there's no helmet. It's you and the magic and the music and the experience. In other words, XR feels real, where social media does not feel real. Jeremy Balinson is the founding, um, founding scholar and the director of the Stanford Virtual Human Interaction Lab, where I'm a visiting scholar. He likes to say that we should think of VR not as a media experience, but closer to an actual experience. And the way that we do this at the lab when we take people on a tour is the first thing we do is we make them walk a plank over a pit. Before we talk to you about how VR can be a tool for empathy and identification with another person, before we talk to you about its potential for education, we wanna really show you how real it feels. So you're gonna walk the plank. And this is also a good setup to help demonstrate one of the long historical successes of VR, which is treating phobias like fear of heights. So after presence, we look to immersion. And this is how users feel like they are really in an alternative environment. Not just that it feels real, but for the, the grown-up theater nerds like me, how we set the scene. A virtual opera performance must have all the trappings of watching a performance in a physical theater. You have to have different views from different seats. You have to have movement flow, flows through the aisles. You have to think about spatially oriented sound that comes from appropriately different locations depending on the origin of the sound. You have to have low light when the performance starts. These are the ways that an XR experience also has to work. You have to include sensory input to stimulate the user, and that includes light, sound, even sense and tactical stimuli. Tactile. Three is embodiment, and this is when you feel like the form of your avatar or physical body is your actual body. A researcher called Mel Slater in the 1990s demonstrated this by taking something called the rubber hand illusion. And that's gonna be the picture, right? The rubber hand illusion. Um, researchers placed a toy hand in a VR environment and went Looney Tunes on it. They hit it with a mallet, they stabbed it with a knife. They really abused this rubber hand. And to the user who looked through VR and saw that rubber hand where their hand should be, and it receiving all of this abuse, people reacted like it was their own hand. Their brain told them that this was a bodily experience. So embodiment is very powerful. It can be beneficial having medical applications. If you didn't abuse the rubber hand, it could actually be used to help treat phantom limb pain if your brain perceives it as your actual limb. It can be used in educational context designed to engender empathy. 
but it can also place users at risk. When you think about the violence and harassment that many users have reported in XR environments. So if this all feels so real, when presence, immersion, and embodiment work together, what about our minds? What happens in an XR experience is processed via your hippocampus. It's the same way that you are sitting here listening to me talk now and creating a memory of the experience. And if you think about it that way, Tom Furness, one of the original creators of head-mounted devices, said that experiences in, in VR are drawn on the brain in permanent ink. It is more like you entering into my living room and screaming in my face than me reading harsh words on a Twitter feed. Because of how XR impacts our bodies and our minds, it is a mistake to simply cut and paste pre-existing content moderation terms of service from flat screen to XR environments. You can't presume the same rules will operate the same way in a 3D environment. Second, there are different stack layers and moderation vectors in spatial computing. I'm gonna break that down so it sounds a, a little more digestible, but content moderation on the traditional internet and social media focuses on two components, user conduct and user content. For example, somebody might analyze a user's posted content on social media to determine if it meets community standards about hate speech, self-harm, pornography. Separately, a content moderation system will determine if a user is, is harassing others through constant messaging or sending out spam or abusing a platform by sending out false reports, content and conduct. XR content moderation is different because it has to consider both of these dimensions, but it also needs to consider the environment in which the content and the conduct occur. This is the key difference. If you're going to create a 3D world, you have to moderate in three dimensions, especially when user-generated content can be the objects in the world and the fundamental architecture of the world itself. This means you can't create a one-size-fits-all code of conduct if you want your rules to be enforceable. In XR, we have a content layer, like individual user experiences, excuse me, a content layer, like individual user experiences, a conduct layer, which hosts user-to-user -user interactions and interactivity between the user and their world, and an environmental layer, the architecture of the worlds along with the digital objects that users build to populate these places. Additionally, VR, AR, and mixed reality have different form factors that lead the user to experience different risks than they would in, in a flat screen social media environment. For example, a user can design a, a strip club and seek to embed it in a VR space aimed primarily for children. It's where it goes, not what it is. A user could impede a virtual pool game by buying somebody else a drink and placing it on the pool table. A normal reaction, a normal game playing dynamic you may think, but if it's done en masse, it can actually impede gameplay. So it functions like spam. A user could also create overlays of Nazi symbols onto real buildings in AR. And the location and type of building would determine the level of risk to the user and to bystanders, even though the symbols themselves are generally inappropriate outside of historical contexts. But what if you wanted to use it in an, in an educational program? It's the way your interface works, combined with your content, that define the level of risk that your users are going to face. Grappling with these environmental dimensions has already had substantial impacts for companies. We talked about the Lego example. I almost started this talk saying that I don't need to use a story. Because if you go into XR, 
with an identity and an appearance like mine, you know very quickly that harassment is a problem. And most people know this, and many, many people have experienced it. You, it's reminiscent of a piece that came out in 2005 called A Rape in Cyberspace that talked about a harassment that occurred in an MMO and what, how the users themselves had to grapple with what you do when something happens to disrupt the culture of your virtual world, but you don't have a set of, of rules and a governance system to deal with it. And this is very similar to what a lot of of virtual world creators are seeing now and what a lot of users are experiencing. Three, platforms are having these problems addressing trust and safety in XR, but it's not due to a lack of will from the companies. It is due primarily to technical constraints. Why didn't Lego just build a filter to take out adult content? Well, you have to look at the way that content moderation works. It's built off of social media models. And the way this functions is through automated filters in an ex-ante fashion. Content is screened using classifiers often before it will hit a user's feed when you're looking at social media. Algorithms are applied to automatically categorize data into one or more categories using classifiers. For example, Facebook will proactively screen and catch 97% of hate speech before it ever hits their feeds. This is because they have a data set of billions and billions of posts, and AI is a fancy form of, of pattern recognition. They have the data set and the ability to automate it and scale it for billions of pieces of content and billions of users. When you get to the XR context, there are no classifiers. Classifiers are problematic. There are not easy, affordable, scalable ways at this time to create these, this pattern recognition filter for governing 3D environments. It's behavioral, it's not text. Data sets for spatial spatial computing-based media would be needed to train the algorithms. And right now, we don't have that mass of content. If that mass of content exists, it's proprietary. If it's proprietary, it's not available to open source developers. Currently, the state of content moderation in XR is this. Either A, it's just not done. B, it relies on user flagging when it is done. Or C, it runs via runarounds, like voice to text, and then running that through the back end of pre-existing social media systems. None of these is great. Some platforms try, are, are trying to develop technological means for this, like attempting to translate audio to text. Then they take that data set, which matches the classifiers they have, run it through the back end and see what comes out. There have not been really promising reliability metrics coming out of this. I think this is because it is a behavioral transaction that is being flattened, run through, and stripped of almost all context. The tactic is also highly resource intensive for being a partial solution, and it's not able to address real-time moderation needs. Reporting a violation in a social platform like Horizon Worlds will give one to two minutes of social content back to the platform. That's not a lot. It is very difficult if you've seen any of these recordings or if you've seen any of the media reportings about what, like what's happening when people are being abusive, it is very hard to tell who said what to whom, who did what to whom, and what is actually going on, with, especially with one to two minutes divorced from the entire interaction. Giving more information seems like the solution, but that's also potentially problematic when you consider that you must balance this with user privacy 
and data storage and retention limitations for head mounted, mounted devices. Furthermore, reporting is done differently on different platforms. And, and I've written about this because to me this seems almost nonsensical and a really interesting way that we as an industry could improve. If you were to, if something were to happen to me right now and you were to call 911, we would know what would happen. The paramedics, the police would come. Imagine if every city we went to, 911 was a different number with a different physical form factor that we had to use to contact the authorities. If we had to show up in person, or we had to call, or we had to send a fax, or we had to send an email, nobody would use it because it wasn't standardized. There's no standardized way to ask for help in virtual worlds. Other newer moderation tools claim to use cues like volume or proximity or emotional recognition to anticipate when an altercation is occurring. And this focuses on limited behavioral cues, so it's not trained on specific communities and cultures. And in that way, the moderation solution it provides is going to be partial at best. Generative AI looks like a promising tool to help, but not in the way you think. The best application that has been seen so far that has the nuance required for content moderation is actually giving it as a tool to existing moderators to help them deal with the best and the worst of humanity that crosses their, their desk every day, to replicate their discretion, but not to help parse and filter the content, conduct, and environmental cues that you would need to process. Realistically, AI content moderation solutions for XR are several years away from being sophisticated enough, having enough data, and having adequate training to work in these environments. So until this changes, companies are going to struggle to automate content moderation for spatial computing like they do for social media. The best practices would be to see companies take dual-tiered content moderation systems like you see in pre-existing gaming worlds. But overall, even with this solution, technical limitations have resulted in the shifting of the burden of moderation from platforms to volunteer guides or community moderators or to users reporting violations of community standards after they've already been abused. My time has run out, so I think that in conclusion, we really must look at terms of service when we are translating them from flat screen to interactive environments. What was the benefit that they were intending to promote? What's the harm they're intended to prevent or mitigate? And what's the underlying philosophy of the enforcement regime? We have to look not just at the rules, but at the enforcement mechanisms designed to enforce these rules. Do they monitor or track content? Do they deter or reinforce behavior? Is this accomplished by adding friction to operations? Finally, we have to understand when we go into XR, it is different for our bodies and different for our minds. This understanding is vital for the immersive context so that the next generation of computing efforts proceeds more mindfully than our first efforts. And so we can avoid making the same mistakes twice. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Mei Ling Wong. I'm the Senior Director of Production at Games for Change and the Executive Producer of this year's festival. Thank you so much for being here. I'm especially delighted to introduce our next talk on GFRC's award-winning VR documentary, On the Morning You Wake, To the End of the World. Please join me in welcoming to the stage XR creative, techno creative strategist and impact producer, Michaela Ternaski holland who collaborated with Games for Change to craft and execute a year-long impact campaign around this project. She is joined by Jan Plas, Professor of Educational Communication and Technology and the Paulette Goddard Chair of Digital Media Le and Learning Sciences at NYU. 
Jan helped evaluate the engagement and impact of the experience, along with partner Bruce Homer of CUNY. And together, Michaela and Jan will present the high-level strategies and key findings behind this groundbreaking collaboration. Good morning, Games for Change Festival, XR for Change Summit. How are we doing? I'll just assume you haven't had lunch yet. Um, we're going to go to the next slide and start with a video. On the Morning You Wake to the End of the World is a virtual reality documentary about the global threat of nuclear weapons by award-winning creators Archer's Mark and Atlas V. The three-part experience immerses the audience in the 2018 Hawaiian False Ballistic Missile Alert with stunning visuals, audio testimonials, and the spoken words of acclaimed poet, Dr. Jamaica Heoli Melakalani Osario. Remember our Aina and all the ways she has fed us in the quiet darkness before the blast. Dive yourself back into the depth of creation, recalling all the times our world has ended before. On the Morning You Wake is at the center of a long-term impact campaign to build awareness and inspire action, led by executive producer Games for Change. With the advice of three impact fellows, Ray Atchison, Lovely Umayam, and Cynthia Lazaroff, and an easily transportable immersive learning experience, Games for Change has showcased On the Morning You Wake to different audiences all around the world, like policymakers, teachers, students, and the general public. We have the support of a network of extraordinary organizations like the United Nations, Nobel Peace Center, and the International Campaign Against Nuclear Weapons. To date, through this impact campaign, Games for Change has presented the project in over 10 countries, hosted over 20 impact and research-based activations, and has had over 3,500 participants. For each screening, Games for Change provides audience members with multiple pathways for engagement through pre- and post-experience surveys and localized calls to action. From surveys, staff interviews, and booking data, Games for Change has published a white paper, impact report, and a best practices field report for XR and social impact. On the Morning You Wake stands for peace. As long as nuclear weapons exist, their presence, production, and potential use will only lead to violence and destruction. Games for Change is committed to making the world a safer and better place using the power of technologies like virtual reality. Through their XR for Change program, Games for Change will continue to empower creators, projects, and impact campaigns, just like on the morning you wake to the end of the world. Um, so what you just saw was a year and a half long impact campaign that I had the pleasure and the honor to craft, produce, and execute alongside of my brilliant collaborator, Aaron Budd, and the Games for Change team. So we went to a lot of different places. I think it's important, first and foremost, to just get on the same page about the language we're using. So I think there is a mis uh, common thread around how we showcase virtual reality. And so for us at Get the Games for Change team, I brought in this language called activations. And activations basically mean we can showcase virtual reality at all different levels and scale. They can be as high quality and high budget as museum-based exhibitions, like what we did at the Museum of Moving Image and Nobel Peace Center. They can also be as you know, shoestring budget, roll into a classroom, set up some headsets and show the experience to some high school students. So the word activation is an all-encompassing term I use when we talk about when we screen VR and how we screen VR. So when we were working on the research, we screened this in over 20 locations and we would break this down into three different categories. We would have activations that were free and open to the public. We would have activations that were dedicated at museums. And then of course we would have activations that were also featured at private events, places like Games for Change Festival. Now, also, before we jump into some of the research, I want to kind of lay the groundwork for how we built this impact campaign strategy. Every VR activation that we did had three big pillars or three big phases, and you'll see them on this slide in blue. Those big phases was onboarding, the actual VR experience, and then aftercare. 
Within those blue circles, you see little green steps. Those were the micro steps that the audience took all throughout the screening within each phase. The red blocks that you see on the stage are the ones that were optional. These were things that we scaled up and down depending on the venue, depending on the partner, depending on the budget. So as you can see, we always believe that you should be able to reserve a time slot for a VR experience. It's not a great look for somebody to be waiting in line. We also made sure we had these things called wraparound materials where you were able to do something before and after the VR experience. The beforehand onboarding survey and the afterwards aftercare surveys were really key on how we continued to structure the research. And of course, as people were exiting the experience, we wanted to make sure that they felt comforted, they wanted to make sure they could have a conversation. So a really important part of our activations and a really incredible part of our research was about the face-to-face -face interactions that people would have with our staff, the face-to-face -face interactions people would have with our impact producers, and the face-to-face -face interactions people would have with our impact fellows. Just because we're talking about technology doesn't mean that we shouldn't remind ourselves that the real change happens with human-to-human -human experiences. The technology is just a vehicle. Now I'd like to welcome to the stage my co-presenter, Jan Plas, to talk a little bit about the research that we did together. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you, Michaela, and hello to everybody. Um, my name is Jan Plass, and together with Bruce Homer, who is in the audience, I think I spotted him over there, we were invited to do something that I think is quite remarkable for an impact campaign like this, which is to conduct actual research with it. Now, most campaigns have some form of survey that they use, but in this case, we actually decided to go beyond that. And um, we did an in-depth analysis of the audience First of all, finding out where and which events they attended. And so here you see the statistics on the uh, open to the public events, the museums and the private events. But you also see that those events were not just in North America, but in other parts of the world, in Europe, Asia, uh, and, and attendees came from Africa, uh, et cetera. So a broad, pretty broad audience, as you would expect at these festivals. Um, but what was interesting is that the reason for attending was not that they came for a specific experience. They were interested in general in what the festival had to order and offer, and they were curious about what the uh, different offerings were of, uh, in this case, uh, uh, VR experiences. There was a moderate number of participants who came to um, see activations because they had heard about it at the event, and then some very few came specifically for In the Morning You Wake. So there is hope that people will still come to these events and be surprised and want to engage with your experiences. Um, the overall analysis of the impact found that there was a relation of how much the audience enjoyed the experience and how much they said they learned. So there was a direct relation of enjoyment and learning, which is something that strikes very close to my heart as somebody who does research on games for learning. So there is that relationship. Enjoyment does actually facilitate learning. And we found that for all ages. You would think that that might just be for certain age groups, but um, as you see in a moment, our uh, range of participants, as far as age was concerned, was pretty broad. And we found this relationship of more enjoyment, more learning across all ages. The engagement results also found uh, that two thirds of the participants said they were very likely uh, or likely to seek out more information. That's a great result. And almost 75% across the board, roughly 75% reported that they were intended to take further action. And that is what impact really means, right? You don't just view something and then you're done with it, but you actually decide to take action, to become active locally to fight against the nuclear threat. Um, so those were the findings from, from our surveys. Um, but what was really exciting about this research is that we did a comparison of virtual reality experience of on the morning to wake and a tablet-based experience. And the tablet-based experience um, used a regular film version of the same experience and uh, delivered that on, on iPads. So we were able to compare those two and our research question was actually, is there more engagement and impact when we have a virtual reality presentation versus a tablet-based presentation. We conducted what you might call an experimental design or A-B testing where we compared those in two different groups and we hypothesized that there was more of an uh, emotional impact and a higher level of engagement. 
What we did was then recruit uh, 171 participants, and you see we went to many different locations. That's uh, Aaron Budd and, and Michaela's team made that possible to actually uh, be in Arizona, Oregon, California, and Florida to collect that data. Uh, and here you see the age range, age range from 18 to 84, which is pretty remarkable for a study like that. Uh, we had a nice distribution of genders and a nice distribution of ethnicities, and I, I have to say that was a lot of work to get there. Um, so the research design then consisted of surveys, um, and Michaela already talked about the onboarding and the aftercare surveys, which we call pre-test and post-test, um, but I love the, uh, the rhetoric she's using much better, so we might switch to that now too. So onboarding, we asked about prior experiences, we asked about um, the interest in nuclear weapons, their attitudes about nuclear weapons, and their emotional state before the experience, and then they were randomized into either virtual reality or uh, tablet-based um, experiences. And then we afterwards, in the aftercare, uh, uh, asked them about what the emotional impact was, what the social connection that they experienced was with the participant, with the uh, people in the in the experience, the level of immersion, their interest, and so on. The research design also included an observation part, and uh, I see some of my students here. So we do user observation research in my user research methods class, and we use that here in um, the study, and we did, we trained observers while the participants were either in VR or in uh, using the tablet to not only check when they started and ended their experience, but also what group and condition they were in, what emotional responses they showed, both in facial expression and in utterances, um, what their uh, level of engagement was, and anything else that was significant in the experience. For instance, somebody being really moved or somebody, which rarely happened, but somebody dropping out early. What we found is actually confirming our hypotheses and confirming what many people say about VR, but where there's very little data, which is we actually did find more positive emotions and stronger emotions in the VR group. So after the experience, we asked them, rate your emotions, what kind of emotions did you have, and how strong were those emotions? And there's a statistically significant difference uh, in what the uh, tablet-based group and the VR group said about it. And we were really interested that there were specific emotions that actually really resonate with the material, which is the group um, that used VR felt more inspired, reported more uh, being inspired, and energized than the group in the 2D. Uh, the participants in the 2D group. So the emotional effect of emotion on uh, the learner, uh, the, the, on VR, on the emotions of the learner is something that we were able to confirm. We also looked at immersion, which is another um, big argument for using virtual reality. Virtual reality is immersive, you have a sense of presence, and we did inf indeed find that the virtual reality group reported more immersion than uh, the 2D group, which is to be expected. What we did not find is that there were differences in uh, feeling a social connection to the uh, characters in the um, experience, so that was the same for both groups. So in, in conclusion, we found that uh, both screenings were very highly rated. Um, both um, level of self-report and interest and emotion um, was a very high level of uh, uh, positive response to that. And um, they also uh, all reported learning a lot from the experiences. But we did find that the participants in virtual reality experienced more emotions, stronger emotions, and these particular emotions compared to the 2D group. And together with the immersive nature that they also responded was stronger, we believe that there's a really good argument to be made to use virtual reality. Uh, so the more intense levels of emotion and more positive responses to the VR screening show the potential of virtual reality for impact storytelling. So those were the results of the finding uh, of the research, and I'm going to pass it back to Michaela because we put all of this into a white paper, and she's going to talk about some of those Thank elements. You. Thank you. Give it up for Jan. So I think a lot of you are probably sitting here coming from two different camps. We have our academia camp, who obviously, hopefully Jan's piece of this uh, presentation was really fulfilling for. And then we also probably have our producers, our creators, and maybe as people who are also in academia, you're interested in asking yourself, how can I conduct a study like this? How can I be as potentially successful in getting these kinds of results and gleaning these kinds of findings? And of course, we gave you the roadmap. We gave you the building blocks at the beginning of this presentation by highlighting the onboarding and the aftercare, by highlighting the fact that we did pre and post experience surveys. But I think there's something else we need to talk about. And that is that virtual reality is not easy, right? You can't just like throw people into a screening room and play a nice big projector. 
it is something that takes really intimate hard work for each and every person that you put through headsets. And it's important to recognize that with On the Morning You Wake, we were using a tetherless headset. It was a standalone headset. We did not need to worry about packing and lugging big pieces of hardware with us other than the headsets themselves. We were not packing and lugging PC computers. We were not packing and lugging PC laptops. We didn't have 10,000 wires. So if you're thinking about creating an experience that's scalable, starting with your developers, starting with your team of engineers, starting with your team of designers, if you want to make this something that can reach many, many, many people, you might want to think about creating a tetherless experience. Now, because we created a tetherless experience, everything I'm about to tell you is going to be pertinent to a tetherless experience, but could also be used for tethered. So I want to make sure we all know that there's a difference. It's important if you are managing multiple, multiple devices that you use some sort of management software. Most headsets require individual account information, but there are ways you can make it easier for yourself and your team to create a scalable VR experience. Our management software over at Games for Change is called Manage XR. It allows us to have a customized home screen, and it also allows us to look at the headsets and make sure they're up to date with whatever builds we want. So we can hit as many builds of different experiences as we want on those headsets. And another piece of item that we found was very helpful were production pelicans. We literally built foam, uh, we really cut out foam in these production pelicans so we could have a rolling, easy to transport solution. I think a lot of people think that virtual reality is gonna be this big, amazing, beautiful thing and then they try it and they hate it but they hate producing these activations because it's so much work, it's so much energy. So Aaron and I together figured out how can we make this easier and not harder? What if it was just like a luggage? We just roll it in, we pop it up, and we get it going. And that's exactly what we did. These VR headset fleets carry four headsets in each Pelican, two iPads, all charging, all batteries, and we have an AirTag that goes into every single Pelican so we can track where that Pelican is all over the world or all over the United States. Another big part that I think people don't talk about is timeline. <laughs> To create a VR activation, there are multiple phases. You have to talk to a partner. That's a huge discussion in of itself. You have to make sure you're thinking about the pre-production phase, the actual production phase, the wrap-up post-production phase. Not just, oh, did we go, did we do it, but are you documenting your actual production? Are you making sure you're taking photos and videos? Are you making sure you're paying people on time? Are you making sure you're training your staff? All of this is a little bit of extra time and energy that maybe something like an iPad-based experience or something like a film experience doesn't take. But virtual reality just takes that extra little bit of time, effort, and energy. Another thing I wanna open up to, the, to you all as shared information, for our team it took us one to four months to create an open to the public experience, four to six months to create a museum exhibit, I recommend six plus months if you can, and for private events, again, one to three months. I mentioned this at the beginning of our presentation and it's important that I go back to it. It is not just about what the technology does, it's about what the people do before and after they use the technology. And so your staff is the most important part of any VR activation. They are the ones that are the make or break of your experience. It is your job, if you are the one leading this VR charge, to make sure that your audience has the best version of a VR-based experience as possible, both inside and outside of a headset, and staff training is really important to do that. Our goals with staff training when we come on site is to always make sure the staff feels empowered, educated, and make sure they understand the intention of the project itself. If the intention of the project is to create a conversation around peace building, we make sure they are empowered to do that. If the intention of the project is to have them leave with a question, we make sure they're empowered to ask them that question at the end of the experience. So no matter what you're doing, make sure your staff is trained. The number of staff you need really depends on the size of your activation and the duration of your VR experience and the type of headset you're going to have. So make sure you always staff adequately. It will take a huge stress and burden off you and your team. So that is about the end. I have about 90 seconds left. I see this counter counting me down. I just wanna say we don't just have a 50 page white paper that Jan and myself and Bruce and Aaron put together. We also have some of these amazing breakout materials that are less than 20 Google Slides. They're quick, easy tidbits that take the best of the best of the white paper and put them in a way that you and your team can look at them quickly and easily. Those are the impact report, 
which really highlights the research, and the best practices guide, which really highlights the impact campaign. So this is where you can find us. I'm sure I'll, since all of you are in the building, you all know where to find Games for Change. But before we end this, I would like to just flash this beautiful QR code so you all can scan it and read and look at the white paper that we are talking to you about today. I just want to thank so much to Games for Change for having us. I want to thank you, the audience, for being here. And of course, I want to give a huge hand to my co-presenter, Jan, for coming here today to talk to me about the work we did. Hi, welcome back everyone. Our next panel explores the newest technologies and their impact on design, gaming, art, music, advertising, and ultimately social change. This panel will address the looming public fears about the misuse of technological innovations and offer potential solutions for avoiding negative impacts. Please join me in welcoming to the stage panel moderator, Samantha Wolf, the founder and CEO of Pitch Ford, Asha Easton, Immerse UK lead at Innovate UK KTN, Dr. Julian Weisenberg, founder of Deep Tech Experts, and Akbar Hamid, founder and CEO of The Fifth Column and Five Crypto. How's everybody doing? Um, so somebody asked me today, they're like, what is this panel about that I was hosting? And I was like, we're just going to talk about all of the future of technology, just a little subject. Um, <laughs> just attempting to do that in our, our uh, 45 minutes. Um, but I was so honored to be asked to uh, be a part of this panel. And then when I was told who was on it, um, I have to admit, I got a little intimidated when I looked at everybody's <laughs> bios. Uh, and so I'm like super excited. And that's why I was like, let's just cover all of these things and see so we can all uh, learn from, from uh, these folks and um, have a little bit of an insight of what's coming. Um, so the way that I'm going to attempt to structure, and we'll see, I tend to like to go with the flow. Uh, a bit is to talk a little bit, do introductions, talk a bit about creativity, um, about brands, about advocacy, and then offer up and sort of wrap up with some advice. So, um, but first, if you can all introduce yourself, um, and I, I said your favorite future technology, uh, and why. And so we'll go sort of like here to there. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Akbar Hamid. I'm the founder and CEO of The Fifth Column, which is one of the leading creative communications agencies driving forward uh, the convergence of brands, emerging tech, innovation, gaming. Um, we work with uh, a lot of incredible uh, companies in the Web3 metaverse space, like The Sandbox, like Doodles. Um, I'm not sure if you all are following or if you all are fans of Camp. If you have young kids, Doodle just announced a big partnership with Camp. So it's really interesting to see an NFT brand now creating uh, a kid's experience at their store in Chicago. So it's really uh, these, these NFT brands are now becoming just entertainment brands. And with the Sandbox, we're creating a lot of fine um, games that have uh, social change missions that we'll talk about um, as well. And then um, we're also advising a lot of the big uh, groups like L'Oreal, Richemont, LVMH, how they should embrace gaming, emerging tech, innovation as really a layer of their marketing strategies and not something completely separate because that doesn't work. And then also I'm the co-founder of People of Crypto Lab, um, and that is a uh, innovation lab and studio building in virtual worlds through the lens of culture. And that's been really incredible because we're actually guiding brands in how to embrace cultural moments like Pride, like Hip Hop 50, like Diwali, and bring, bring in their authentic brand message in gaming worlds um, through these narratives. So it's been really, really fun. 
Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Asha Easton, and I run an organization called Immerse UK, which is the UK government's innovation network for immersive and metaverse technologies. Um, and we are part of a large organization called Innovate UK KTN. Um, and the, the point of the large organization is to facilitate cross-sector innovation across kind of all industries in, in the UK and to help companies to access things like R&D grant funding for their businesses. Um, at Immerse UK, we work specifically across the, the XR ecosystem. Our role is really to help to grow it, uh, make it less fragmented, connect the different kind of hubs across the country, um, help UK businesses to scale and, and connect them with the academic community. And all the work that we do kind of feeds back into the government to determine future policy and for the space. Um, R&D funding strategy around immersive specifically. Um, so that's my day job, uh, but on the side I also do a number of different things as well. I helped co-found something called the XR Diversity Initiative, um, which helps to upskill people from underrepresented backgrounds with, with XR skills and help get, the, get their foot in the door into the industry. That's really the, the, the reason for being, um, helping people get their hands on kit they might not have access to, getting them to rapidly prototype something in a day so they feel confident that they can actually, uh, you know, maybe take, a, take that route into the industry. Um, and then I also sit on the board of the first Metaverse Fund for Europe, FOV Ventures, helping them with their kind of diversity initiatives. And I'm Julian Weissenberg. I'm an AI expert. My background is in computer vision and machine learning. Um, and I work mostly for uh, investors. I check startups for them, uh, see if the tech is good. I'm also an expert for the Swiss Innovation Agency. And I'll start answering the question about uh, favorite technology. Uh, it's still AI. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been in the field for uh, 14 years now, uh, but I still think it's, uh, it's the future. And uh, what I like about it, why I love it, is because I think it tells a bit about a piece of ourselves. If we understand how to replicate intelligence, maybe we understand a bit how we work as well. Amazing. And I'm Sam Wolf. Um, I realized I didn't inter introduce myself. Uh, I work on branding, marketing, and um, uh, business strategies with emerging technology. Uh, I've co-authored a couple of books, one on the metaverse that came out in February and sort of all of the metaverse, over 20 different industries. And I'm uh, about to start my fourth year as an adjunct at NYU. I've taught uh, business of AR and VR, marketing of emerging tech, business in the metaverse and avatar and virtual beings. So I love this stuff is um, the simple. Um, and I love explaining it and helping people to understand it. We um, you what? We need that. <laughs> yes. OK. So um, one of my favorite things about emerging tech is how uh, it can actually enable creativity and art and, and new ways of, of, of doing things, and it's almost like after the developers develop it, then the artists get their hands on it. And so um, how do you think, how have you seen that happen within you know, your organizations, and, and what do you think of the potential of these technologies for creativity? It's um, such a powerful tool. We've, um, one aspect that's really interesting is exploring um, identity with avatars and what is your identity when you show up in virtual worlds and virtual spaces. And so that's been a really interesting conversation because are you showing up as yourself and, and do you want to show up as yourself or do you want to show up as something um, that you believe you are? You know, So that's been really interesting for us as we're exploring social uh, movements and um, uh, you know uh, just different social issues because it's really incredible in a game if you you know are exploring your identity whether it's your sexual identity your gender identity and in a gaming world you can show up as something maybe that makes you feel more like your authentic self that you're not ready to embrace in the real world yet so we're, we're those are really interesting conversations because what a platform to make um, somebody feel sort of included and seen and heard um, and for them to kind of be able to test different things and 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 um, and then also just imaginary ways, right? Like, um, you know, we're exploring with brands. Um, if you, you know, you're a luggage brand, um, you know, wh what, how do you reimagine the luggage in a virtual world or gaming space? Like, does, does it give you special powers? Does it give you um, access, like IRL access to unique destination experiences? In the, so there, there's, there's, there's so much creativity um, uh, in the sandbox specifically, uh, you know, relating to fashion and culture, we're exploring like, 
um, wings and, and how could wings give your avatar a specific uh, set of skills or utility. So I think it, it really, it's interesting because we, we sit in brainstorms and I sit with my team, um, you know, who all come from traditional uh, marketing and communications backgrounds and it really feels like we're kids again which is really, really fun because we're sitting around and we're like, what, we're, we start laughing because we're like, we're talking about like wings and, and dragons and, you know, and, <laughs> and, 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 you're, and we're talking about an LVMH brand and, and really they're giving us the authority to explore it in this way. Um, so, so I think it really has brought us back to that childlike um, sensibility, which I think is so important um, when you are being a creative. So I think it's been a really nice reset. What about you, Ashley? Um, I think the thing that's been the most interesting for me in this position in, in Immerse um, has been watching the evolution of, of storytelling in XR over the years and um, the way that UX and UI design has evolved, the way people, you know, take on board more, the onboarding and offboarding of people into experiences um, and the innovation that's gone on behind that. In the UK, we have some of the most amazing projects. You've probably seen people who've been in the circuit of the, the festivals, you know, we see UK projects winning, you know, quite regularly and just seeing how, where that's gone, it's been uh, really incredible. Um, and I just, I think, for me, the thing I'm most excited about in the future of XR creativity is around the low-code, no-code tools that are out there or the kind of 3D design tools that enable people to design in 3D without needing to actually know how to you know, program. Um, things like Shapes XR, being able to you know, sculpt or paint or do whatever you can in, in virtual space, that's what I'm really interested in. And then, Julian, I'm going to have to ask the flip mm -hmm. side of things um, and sort of generative AI and creativity and for the good or for the bad, do you have sort of perspectives on, on both? Yeah, of course. Um, so first of all, I think the, the impact of um, Gen AI on creativity is that there, there, there has been a mega trend of uh, the industrial revolution of standardizing products and making them mass scale. And this is, I think, about to get reversed when we can personalize games and create experiences which are for certain, um, like for each and every individual could be a different experience. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the second thing is um, uh, think of uh, photography as a technology back uh, then, how this disrupted the uh, painter's business. Because until then you had painters that were paid to depict what they saw and all of a sudden they would start uh, to not be so relevant anymore. So uh, then they completely changed um, their work and that's how they moved from depicting realistic things to abstract art and that's why maybe you had all these Picassos and so on. So today I think the same might happen where if it's so easy to create a video game, then maybe we'll see different kinds of video games that the AIs cannot create yet. That's amazing. Um, so in terms of, I know that the access and funding, actually you get very involved in that. Can you talk a little bit about how to make sure that people are, um, that it's not just sort of a, 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 a few people who get access to be able to create? How do, how do we broaden that? I think it, we had a really interesting conversation yesterday um, around like the, for me, the, the problem with access is that I feel like there's like a broken pipeline of all the interventions that need to happen to actually be more welcoming and opening and accessible to more people. Um, so a lot of diversity initiatives, for example, um, that exist are l small scale, they're underfunded, they're volunteer run, they're not speaking to each other or working together. Um, and I think that there's like a whole, uh, we're bringing together a bunch of different working groups in a work, in Immerse, one on diversity, inclusion, accessibility, sustainability, ethics, and it's about bringing together anyone doing work in those spaces so they're speaking to each other and making sure that we're, um, the way I like to put it is, for example, with like for example, XRDI, right? It's get the foot in the door, program something in a day, um, but well, what's, what's the, what's, what journey do people need to go on to then either branch off into a career in any of these spaces or to become a founder in one of the, in these spaces that can then be funded by someone like FOV. Um, and there's like a whole series of intervention and help that needs to happen on that whole journey. 
Um, and I think that that is, is still really, really broken at the moment. But there's still a huge potential and opportunity for us to all work together and fix that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for me, sort of what happens after a certain amount of creativity and artists um, that brands come in and say, wow, we could do this. How are we going to use this and figure out how to uh, create sort of new stories, new ways to tell you know, brand storytelling, not necessarily strict um, creative storytelling. And that's where your company comes in. So can you talk a little bit about how these technologies have sort of changed? You said already that you're thinking about flying dragons and, and, yeah. and so on and so forth. But, but um, how, how are these different technologies impacting those discussions even, even more? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and right before I, I jump into that, I wanted to just, on the point of funding, um, we did a, um, a research report with Boston Consulting Group, one of our strategic partners, and um, they found that only 13% of founding teams of, uh, of Web3 um, emerging tech startups uh, included um, at least one woman and only 3% had an executive team that is exclusively yeah. female. So yeah. it's crazy. <laughs> and, um, but yes, there's a lot of opportunity to affect change, um, but we you know, have to start with the mindset shift from, from the ground up. So that's a lot of the work that you know, we're doing as well by bringing in um, storytelling around, uh, you know, around women, women of color, LGBTQIA, disabled community, because we need to bring those people in to start working in the ecosystem to then s have these ideas come to life that can then be funded. And we need more um, women like Caitlin Holloway, who's a uh, partner at 776, Alexis Ohanian, um, you know, his fund, and it's, uh, she's really leading the charge there. And so, um, you know, more women like her who are funding um, startups that are that are run by women. So we have a lot of work to do, but um, we're still so early yeah. on. Yeah, and you need more like diversity in VC as well. In Correct. order to that, yeah. we need more diversity in VC. We need more diversity across the board in founders and, and creatives. Um, we need more uh, access to, for example, R&D funding in government. It's, um, someone made a comment in a previous panel which was saying how it's uh, understanding how to even access grant funding in government. It is. It is, it's not, I'm, I'm in government, okay, and I'm telling you it's so complicated, uh, and people very, it, even to find us and to find these opportunities is very difficult. Then to understand how to get them, uh, very difficult to know who to speak to. All of this stuff can be hopefully demystified by something like AI, but yeah, there's, a, there's so many different layers to the funding journey and different, uh, different aspects need to be Yeah, connected. I mean, I think that that's why sometimes it is that you get the funding, you want the grant to be able to do the creative, but sometimes the funding can come from brands to be able to create yeah. something new yes, and sort of well, different and exciting, and it's not necessarily yeah. like sell, sell, sell kind of advertising, no. which I can't stand, um, but more like experiential. Well, that's the workaround, right? To go straight to private to private funding. Yeah. yeah, and that's a great segue into brands um, and their narratives in their in the space, um, and sort of also coinciding with different funds. Like the Sandbox actually has a game maker fund, mm -hmm. and they'll find um, uh, startups and companies with great vision, anywhere from you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars to two hundred thousand dollars, depending on the scale of the game. So there are things like that, but yeah. you know, I only know that because we work with them. Yeah. Uh, so I think you know, there there is a bit more um, uh, uh, we need to do on the outreach. But there are programs, and I think this is sort of an interesting uh, story because it's my journey of founding a startup while having a company, which was <laughs> which was based in this, and then also bringing in the funding from L'Oreal and. Yeah. Um, so it's really about creating, you know, the idea and and the vision. And for us, what we did, what what we're realizing with brands is initially it was all about the hype and the announcement, which we saw in the last two years. Everybody just wanted to be first, and a lot of brands and portfolios like LVMH were last to e-commerce, so they want to be first to Web three. So everybody was just trying to make announcements that had no real um, <laughs> connectivity or and community. substance, <laughs> yeah, or yeah. community, um, because they were just trying to, you know, be first movers uh, and not be last in tech. Now we're seeing brands really take the time to like look at their narrative, work with companies like ourselves in different development studios of what's our story, what's the story we want to tell, um, how do we want to bring that through. So with L'Oreal and NYX Cosmetics specifically, they're a brand that stands for supporting the LGBTQIA plus community year round. That's their entire platform is Pride 365. 
And so um, when we were connected with them, we, you know, had this, we were already building this first ever Metaverse Pride uh, moment that was greenlit by the Sandbox through the Game Maker Fund. So we went to them with an idea and a vision, and literally they um, believed in it so much in bringing diverse and inclusive storytelling to their gaming world that they gave us a $200,000 grant to build this game, which was absolutely incredible. And it, and it was literally, you know, me taking the initiative to write a really our heartfelt email and, and after a 5 a.m. meditation with um, zero filters. And it was a bit tricky because it was also my client on the agency side, but then me also writing as a human and just writing a really long email. And literally it was green lit in 15 minutes. They thought it was brilliant and they loved that there was somebody with that passion to bring in a whole new community to an ecosystem and also give voices to community members that hadn't felt um, the power to maybe you know share their story. So it was a, a mix of that and have being greenlit to build that, but then thinking, you know, is there a brand that might fit well with the narrative and help us reach 20 more million people through their yeah. following, you know, and bring in and bring in new audiences. So that was a really um, a, a great example of sort of a perfect um, partnership of sorts. But um, we we created the 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 whole game narrative, and it was a, it was essentially bringing in um, queer, you know, disabled community, LGBTQIA drag queens, and it was a whole quest built around um, learning about pride and then ending up at a pride party in the sky. It was just meant to be fun and, and informative, and it, it, it wasn't developed into a really intense game narrative yet. We only had 90 days to bring it to life. Uh, and um, what was really impactful about this is on the brand side is the brand decided that this had nothing to do with product, which is really important in these uh, experiences and in these ecosystems, uh, specifically in the sandbox and others we work with, you know, people don't want to see a product. They, that's not kind of the experience they want. Uh, you know, you don't put a literal mirror image. They want to um, have a meaningful experience and the brand should come through in the narrative. So we had uh, you know, we had a dance floor in the game where you could go with your avatar and dance and have fun and interact. And it said, say gay, because the legislation that was happening last June, you know, in Florida. So we were bringing in um, sociocultural, political uh, messages, but in a, in a really um, subtle way so that people could come in and kind of feel that they're taking a stand and share. The, we had a lot of people sharing screen grabs of that on Twitter. And so the brand, and we put in a lot of the brand's messaging and the slogans that they stand for without the actual brand itself. But it was very obvious um, if you did know the brand that it was a NYX Cosmetics um, experience. And on the social impact side, what was incredible with Metaverse and these virtual worlds is they're global. So if you have access to internet and a computer, which I know we're still you know, far behind in many places of the world, but you can access these worlds. So the huge impact, which we were hoping for and didn't know that would happen was we had people from parts of the world where it's illegal to celebrate being LGBTQA, like India, like Pakistan, like parts of Southeast Asia, come in and share in our Discord. It was the first time that they celebrated their identity. So that to us, and I think even to the brand, was extremely powerful beyond any brand message, just giving a, um, a platform where people were uh, you know, seen and heard. And, and those kinds of games and those kinds of worlds can definitely be life-saving moments um, when people are struggling with their identity. So I think we just scratched the surface of what the possibility could be. Um, so yeah, that's, that's an, one example of how a brand, um, and, and a huge brand, global brand, is leaning into this. That's really interesting, yeah. I think the, the LGBTQ Museum by Antonio Forrester also had like a pretty similar yes. reaction. It was like touring the last couple last year, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So diversity and inclusion in AI. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there has to be lots of discussion going yeah. around about uh, uh, about that. And I, what is your what are your thoughts on? Mm -hmm. on, Bias on those AI. Topics. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> so I'm like, topic. it's uh, a difficult topic uh, right. for sure. So of course you have the, the problem of uh, biases which usually um, come in the first place from the data sets uh, and you have the risk of perpetuating biases uh, because you just use these data. I think one interesting thing is to note that uh, using um, the result and if you see that there is a bias then it's it's also showing that there is a bias in the data set probably. So I think it's important to close the loop in the first place and uh, reflect on that. So it's a way, first of all, to discover uh, biases. But then, um, uh, of course, like I, I think now AI 
the AI community is, has become quite good in principle at um, correcting these. The, the main problem that I could see coming in the future is uh, with Gen AIs that um, um, are learning from past data, maybe will get a bit stuck in terms of social norms. Uh, so I think there is a risk that we just start writing the same things over and over again. And if we think about the evolution of social norms, just if you go back 50 years ago, um, many things have changed. So I think it's not a good idea if we get stuck uh, right now, even if we think we're at a good place. So how do you accommodate for that? Like how do you, if you're planning for that new, is there any, is that a future solution that hasn't been right. developed yet or? I think this is a hard one um, because what I know about humans is we're lazy. <laughs> so, so I think if we get a suggestion of let's say a generated text, then are we really going to edit it and, right. and depart from that? I'm not sure. Yeah, no, I have a thing in one of my classes where I looked up all of the things that humans do that are not great, and it was like a list of like 10, <laughs> and each of them you could apply to like what happens with the internet and social media, and it was like so, so if you know all of these things could happen, then you need to be accommodating for them in future technology, even if it's, even if you don't like to think about it, that you still you need to say, well, probably people are gonna steal. Like, okay, how can we stop that? You know, so on and so forth. Um, so, so how can we, you know, sort of use these different technologies for, for, for good to help, um, to increase the sort of amount of, of access and creativity and, and Ashan, look at you for this, for the solution for everyone, by the way. Oh <laughs> well, you know, I feel like I'm preaching to the converted here because everyone, I feel like there's so many people in this audience who are already building those experiences. So we right. know the application of, of immersive for, you know, for education, for uh, health services, for mental health. We have a whole program in the UK that's funded by the government now around XR and mental health um, research, R&D. Um, and the, the whole point of that is to not, we, we already know that that's, a, that's um, uh, something that, that's valuable, but it's creating this whole new way to enable those uh, companies to work in the NHS. I think that like, that's kind of the problem, is like we, we, already, we already know the, eff the effectiveness, but it's more about what's the, de what's the deployment at scale look like, and how do we, how do, we do that in areas like healthcare, um, or for like social services, or other, other thoughts. There's, there, there's so many applications. I, I um, was, was reading something about AI being, you know, having an emotional mental health support system utilizing AI technology. I think that that's really powerful when you're thinking about like suicide prevention hotlines and sort of tools that might be needed, you know, or, you know, any, if anyone's dealing with any sort of crisis, but to be able to have um, some sort of, um, AI tool that you can speak to that actually can give you guidance or support or um, talk speak back to you in a moment where you know you need someone but you don't have someone. So there was a I little there was a little robot that was show. What was the name? The name of that Moxie. Yeah, wonderful. It was a, a robot like an AI little robot for children um, that was supposed to be helping them with yeah. their understanding development development and mental. Yeah, health. no. Yeah. In my avatars and virtual beings class, I ask them for their final paper, my students for their final paper to create um, a project, a pretend virtual being for good, mm -hmm. um, and what would it be? And I, the, the two most common, one was a, um, a like non-binary humans, that's mm -hmm. one thing that they, like it was about a third of the class, and this is, they're all doing it individually, and about half had mental health, like they all wanted sort of a mental health you know, virtual being to help. Yeah, it's them. Uh, yeah, it's in, uh, incredible. In in um, you know, if you even think of like emotional support uh, for children who are being bullied and things like that, right? To have a a, a friend in a way, um, um, you know, somebody to talk to for guidance. I think it's really powerful. Um, There's a report I just saw that came. I think today it might have been spoken about later today, but uh, it was saying that something like eighty seven percent of kids or children. Um, go looking for mental health guidance online, um, you know, and that's 
this is where they access that kind of information. So using it, finding tools that are have AI applications to it or an XR experience, um, there's lots of potential for the future for that. Um, sustainability as well, if we're thinking, um, you know, we've spoken to a lot of people developing tools for fashion and retail. And um, if you think about sustainability aspects of, uh, especially in the US, we're such an over consumption, you know, um, market. And um, if you look at fast fashion, but there's tools that people are creating where, uh, and apps where you can literally know everything you have in your closet or and when you go into a store, if you're using that app, it can uh, tell you you already have something or, you know, pair something for you. And so there's a lot of, um, you know, applications uh, like that, that if used in mass, um, can really uh, slow down sort of overconsumption and, and create more um, sustainability in terms of reuse uh, and wearability. There's also in terms of um, vintage, uh, you know, clothing and, and sort of the resale market, uh, NFC chips and different technologies that'll make it much easier to kind of sell uh, directly, you know, peer to peer and, and um, in the long term affect change. Yeah, the sustainability aspect of, of immersive as well. Remote collaboration, obviously, like not having to travel. There's so much, uh, you know, information about that. We, the reason we started the, actually the sustainability working group, though, at Immerse, there's two 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 uh, reasons for it. One is to actually have the industry look at itself, <laughs> um, and um, you know, have conversations with all the main you know hardware providers and things like that, um, and and understand the the footprint of our industry more and how we can be more sustainable. Um, but then also to communicate the, uh, the carbon saving uh, aspect of XR technology at a different level in government. So there's a huge net zero agendas across the board, across the world. It's massive, it's definitely massive in the UK. And we want this technology to be part of that conversation, which it's not really at the moment. Right. I think AI could be a game changer in um, um, customizing education which would be really useful to, to get um, people to the next level. And, um, and also because so far it's been really a mass produced education system, uh, which in a way is also excluding, like depending on uh, how you like to learn. And uh, also depending on where you live and your background, this could be a, a problem. So I, I think this could really be a really a good thing. I'm really excited about the future of like AI driven characters and there's, so, uh, there's tons of research and, and companies I know that are working on things like, you know, the future of philosophy education or history education and actually having AI driven characters interacting with students in those spaces. Yeah, I went Still pretty new, but that's, that was actually like a dream of mine from when I got into the industry <laughs> many years ago. I was like, oh my God, how can, we, how, can we, how can we have that? Like someone actually debating a philosopher in a virtual space and that's how they learn it because we know kids, no, well, well, kids read, but not as much as they did. <laughs> we know it's, it's, it, the attention spans are different. The way we learn is different. The way people engage with education is different now. So this yeah. really you can train the AI based on the philosopher's writing. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. There's research being done in different, some different universities yeah. in the UK around that. I did a talk for my high school reunion this summer where I got to guess what would be 25 years in the future for my high school and use generative AI images and like said, how is it going to change the students? How will it change the teaching? How will it change the experience? And sort of fun thought experiment about where it could all go for sure. Um, I think I'm really, the thing I'm really interested in and concerned about um, is the upskilling of educators um, as this happens because it's, uh, it's, things are moving so fast as we all know and as we're all experiencing. Um, and that we know that governments don't move quick, education curriculum development doesn't move quick. Um, so I think different programs that can enable that to happen. There's a, there was a great one in the UK that was done by Story Futures Academy called Train the Trainer. And it was actually like funded program to actually enable educators to come and upskill themselves so that they could upskill their programs and understand how to teach this new technology. But I think that's the kind of stuff is really important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you a question I didn't prepare you for just because it came to mind, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, <that's cool. laughs> so if, if I could um, like give each of you a grant, which I do not have the money. <laughs> <laughs> I do not. But let's pretend like that I just said, here's a grant of 
a million dollars, let's make it up because it's fake money. Um, what would you, each of you, do with that if you had to like, create change, create social change? So you can't just go, OK, thank you very much. That was really nice, <laughs> Sam. Um, but instead, say, we're going to do this and put it to good, for good, with future technologies to plan for the future. What would each of you do with that? And I don't need a budget, don't worry, because the money doesn't exist. Um, but what, I'm going to start. Okay, so the first thing that comes to my mind again is education. I think it's the foundation of building up a, a good uh, society. Um, and then once you have education, you can, you can have people who will be flourishing. Uh, and so in that regard, I think um, maybe um, creating platforms or tools that will enable um, students in remote areas or places where they don't have access to a high quality education. Um, I think that could be uh, something I would do. I would fund that whole diversity pipeline thing that we're talking about before. <laughs> um, you know, getting all the ducks in a line with everyone that we know that's doing any work around this, figuring out, you know, are we duplicating efforts in any, in any areas? Can we maybe shift what each of us is working on so that we're addressing that whole pipeline and then funding all of those programs um, across the board? And then um, hopefully, ideally, <laughs> off the back of that, industry would then, would then step up and then help to fund it because everyone keeps talking about we want to hire more diverse people, we want to fund more diverse founders, but we can't find them. And I go, okay, well, you know, there's so many programs out there that are trying really hard to create that pipeline for you, and none of them are, are you know, properly supported. Support them, and then you will have a pipeline, and you will have a big pool of talent. But that takes time to build, and I think, in the, yeah, so that's what I'd do with it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry to get it. It's like buying a lottery ticket that doesn't exist. But okay. <laughs> yes. Um, I would probably equally um, invest it in women-owned um, startups and projects in AI, Web3 gaming, um, and virtual worlds that are all solving for different, um, uh, different um, applications that will create more inclusive um, storytelling. But I think, um, yeah, the more women we have... Um, at the table leading these initiatives will, will automatically lead to more inclusivity because yeah. um, women will, will advocate for all communities. Yeah. I, no, and then I'll, I'll ask myself that even though I didn't prepare an answer for myself because I didn't even know that the question was going to exist, <laughs> um, that I think I would probably start an organization to train and access, like allow more people because I, the, the students in my classes come in, they're media studies students primarily, and they're like, I don't know technology, I don't know, I don't right. know how I'm gonna do this. Exactly, and, it's like a fear. And, yeah. and they're like, I don't know how to code, I don't know how to do that. And I'm like, don't worry, like deep breath, like the goal is for you to at least start to understand it without knowing the technology and start to see, I had, I've invited probably 200 guests to my class over the years, who, where I ask everybody to give like their origin story so that people can see like, gosh, that could be me, um, as opposed to saying, nope, 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 I don't understand it at all. And then um, usually about 10% of my class ends up switching careers, which is pretty wild. They go in going, I don't know anything to like, wait a second, I wanna do this. And then, um, and then the passion is there and the learning will happen. Um, and so, at least for me, I would want to do it in a more than my my 25 to 50 students yeah. a semester um, to sort of change the trajectory of where they're going. Because you need, you know, most of my um, class tends to be, uh, you know, diverse background. So. I would also put money into um, early education as well, specifically around this stuff, because we get. <laughs> All the, a lot of the efforts I feel like now are, are mostly focused older, university, high school level, but kids don't even know, we don't even necessarily know what the jobs are gonna be in 10 to 15 years, honestly, these yeah. days. Um, but there are so many jobs that have even just become available in the last five years that, yeah. you know, guidance counselors don't even know about them. So how do we get that information yeah. to kids and inspire them to, yeah, I, I had that in, in my 
in my talk and in, in, even in the book about like all the potential job, you know, different kinds of jobs that might be out there that we don't yeah. know. And so much about it is being open and flexible to learning yeah. and understanding and not saying like, you know, oh, I don't know this. It, it's funny, even people who, um, who I've met who are uh, on the older end of the spectrum, not necessarily elementary school, um, will be like, oh, I don't know this either. And they have that same kind of reaction. And this idea of, of not knowing and being OK yeah. with not knowing yeah. Um, is sort of like, what? You mean I can go into a meeting, I can go into a business meeting talking you know, with you about maybe doing something and, and be okay that I don't know all the answers and that isn't something that they're used to. Um, uh, so it's sort of fun. I feel like we can fear AI, we can fear a new technology or we could just see this as like, potent instead as potentially the beginning of a completely new creative renaissance when you have you know, AI and no code, low code tools and all these things that make it so accessible to people that would never who fear, fear coding or whatever else, then, you know, there's a huge right. opportunity there. Yeah. yeah, there was one parent I met once and he was like, you mean I don't have to teach my kids how to code? And I'm like, you may have, like it might be a good skill, but it might not necessarily be one that they're gonna be using when they're, you know, going to college. It might be a different. Yeah, we have to lean into it, not away from it and we tell all the, the brand C-suite leaders we meet exactly, it's nothing to fear and you, and you, you really have to lean in. And, it, and I think just on your story, I mean, I'm a non-tech founder. I have a tech startup backed by major VCs um, and I just entered and pivoted into the space four years ago and carved out a whole niche for a consumer driven agency and you know, a large part of our team all comes from decades, you know, running brands like Nike and Target and, and different, you know, wine and spirits and fashion and you know, and, and they're all working in the space. So I think it's it's up a few four or five years ago before yeah. the pandemic, I, I never would have thought I would have <laughs> been in the space. So I think it's totally something you can learn and right. lean into. And then I had said before this that I use pictures from your, I hadn't met you before, and I use pictures from your experience in my class. So That's just it was so sort incredible. of funny. <laughs> um, the, uh, so I wanted to end with just like advice to our audience, like whatever. And I think we're already sort of giving a certain amount. Um, but if they wanted to create or make an impact or whatever, what you would suggest that they, they do, um, what could they take away from sort of our panel or from your your experiences and I'll, I'll go this way this yeah time. I think um, Lee you know it, we're really early on so it's it seems like oh so much is happening it, it hasn't so there's a lot that you can still do look into the different grants and funds um, uh, like the game maker fund um, at the sandbox but also uh, and I am not a fan of discord at all um, it's so complicated unnecessarily so but um, if I would recommend just joining different brand um, communities um, on Discord, um, you know, following different Twitter spaces and really just immersing yourself. And a lot of these um, leaders and thought leaders in the space are very responsive. So, you know, Twitter DMs, reaching out on Discord, you'd be surprised how helpful um, and resourceful that can be. So if you're really interested, just, I, I mean, it's really important to kind of immerse yourself in the conferences like you are now, but definitely in the Twitter spaces, the Discord chat rooms and, and just talking to people um, and not being afraid to share your ideas, which is exactly how, you know, we got okay. Metaverse Pride greenlit. Although I do tell my students that do at least like five minutes of research before you reach out to them. Yeah. To compliment yeah, yeah. them on something that they yes. did, whatever it might be. <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, usually right after a talk, if you reach out on LinkedIn or after Twitter spaces, um, uh, I think, um, yeah, so I think really just don't be afraid to, to do that and, and don't worry if you don't know much about the space at all. Uh, everybody's very eager to, to teach and, and help. Yeah, mine is always to just try as many experiences as you can. Um, you know, jump through virtual worlds and VR chat. I think, unfortunately, some of the most innovative and amazing projects are going to be at festivals like this. And I think it's such a shame that we can't distribute them more widely, oftentimes. Um, but anytime you can get to um, events like this and, and go and try the arcade, and, and that is really, really important to understand like where things are going with the technology. Um, and then the other thing I always just say to people, it's just build stuff. 
you know, even if you're not technical, go and just experiment, you know, see what you can do. And if you're in one space, like your head's down, we all have so much work to do. We all have so much on our plates. If you're an XR expert and you're not necessarily an AI expert, make the time, carve out time for yourself to go and explore those other technologies because they're converging so fast. Um, it's, it's a necessity actually at this point. So I think like even people in the industry already make time for yourself to upskill in other areas or at least explore those other areas. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. I think it's hard to predict uh, the future. Yeah. So <laughs> we can. Just a little bit. Right? The yeah. only thing that you can do is keep learning, uh, adapt very quickly. As soon as there is something new that catches your attention that you think you could be using, just try it, use it, learn from it, see if you can combine it with other things, play with things. I think keep a child's perspective on things, because uh, when you grow up as a child, everything is changing all the time, and that's the world that we live in now. Yeah, I do think that that's been one of the sort of greatest things about working in emerging technology is that everybody's learning all of the time. Um, and so when you yeah. end up talking to other people, be like, oh, you heard about that? Oh, I heard about this. Oh, you heard about, yeah. have you tried yeah. this? And it becomes this sort of big area where everybody is trying to sort of help each other while yeah. they're learning. I took a few days off just so that I could go and uh, set myself a, <laughs> a goal of trying to create a VR animated film that I've had wanting to be doing with a friend for ages um, and doing it from start to finish just using AI tools just to see how far we could get with that. That was interesting. <laughs> and yeah. the answer is like not super far, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, I, I guess that's why a lot of people like sharing on so whatever it is when the things break, because the things yeah. do mess up. And, and that's sort of yeah. part of that process. And why you know some of AI stuff is sort of breaking before our very eyes. Yeah. And people aren't necessarily used to seeing that unless you've already worked in emerging tech. Um, and you know things are always shifting and changing, so you do have to just keep learning. Yeah. But thank you so much for uh, this panel today. It's been really fun. Sorry to throw in a pretend grant in the middle of everything. Um, <laughs> Next but, time. Yes, exactly. Next time, a real one. Uh, no. uh, but thank you all. Thank you all. And thank you all for thank listening. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you for attending the morning sessions. We will take a break and resume again at 1.45 p.m. with a panel, Augmented Teenagers, Can the Metaverse Be Good for Youth Mental Health? Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>